The sun was just beginning to set as I stepped into the dusty parking lot of the old truck stop. The place seemed to be frozen in time, but I wasn't one to turn down a simple side job. My name is Clark Bentley, and I figured becoming a caretaker for this remote pit stop would give me enough time for brainstorming my new novel. I was met by the only other person I'd seen for miles, standing next to an old red pickup. You must be Clark. I'm Vernon Gable, he said, extending his hand. I appreciate you coming all this way. It's not a glamorous spot, but it's got its charm. As we walked into the dimly lit truck stop diner, Vernon let out a small chuckle. By the way, why did the Scarecrow win an award? he asked with apparent amusement. I raised an eyebrow at him and waited for the punchline. Because he was outstanding in his field. He roared with laughter and slapped his knee. After getting settled in my little room attached to the diner's kitchen, I figured it was time to explore the area. So I grabbed my flashlight and headed out into the wilderness surrounding us. As the darkness enveloped me, I felt a sudden chill crawl up my spine. My flashlight led me towards an eerie scene. Animal carcasses scattered throughout a small clearing in various stages of decay. A burning sensation shot through my hand as if from invisible fire, causing me to drop my flashlight into rotting entrails below. Suddenly, there was movement within this grotesque sight. Something elongated and eerily silent circled around me. I ran back towards the truck stop with whatever composure I could muster when a tall creature emerged from the shadows, so tall it had to strain its head downwards to avoid getting entangled in tree branches. A deer skull with jagged antlers crowned its lanky torso. Horrified, I fumbled with my phone, attempting to call for help. No service mocked my screen. This creature, this unearthly nightmare— crawled closer on its elongated limbs, and I could see its hunger burning in its hollow eye sockets. Suddenly, I remembered the old shotgun Vernon had mentioned was behind the counter, for emergencies. This can hardly be called anything less, I thought. Locking the door behind me, I dashed to grab the weapon and loaded it as quickly as possible. The sound of breaking glass filled the air as the creature crashed through a window in pursuit of me. It lunged at me with bony claws extended menacingly. The blast from the shotgun sounded like a thunderclap inside the diner. Smoke hung heavy in the air as I quickly realized one shot wasn't enough to take down this monstrosity. Its strange body twisted around before rushing me again with a heart-stopping speed. Suddenly— there was a cacophony of gunfire coming from outside, accompanied by panicked voices. Was it possible that someone else was out there? Did they know what they were up against? I didn't take long to find out that more people had stumbled upon this horrific scene and were doing their best to survive against something that should not exist in our world, an unspeakable menace that fed on fear and flesh alike. Desperately trying to reload my shotgun faster than my shaking hands would allow, I couldn't help but wish I had time to warn these strangers about what they faced. The air was thick with tension as bullets flew past me into that grotesque mass, each one accompanied by an unholy screech. But no matter how many rounds pierced its emaciated body, it still moved with terrifying speed and grace. As if driven mad by pain or rage or both, it seemed even more determined to tear every last one of us limb from limb. Suddenly, with a wet ripping sound, the creature tore Vernon's arm from its socket. The scene around me transformed into absolute chaos. Shots rang through the din and were met by agonized screams. I did my best to aim and fire as the creature lunged back toward me. An explosion shook the diner when a stray bullet hit the diner's gas line, sending debris flying everywhere. Blood mixed with fuel as an inferno erupted around us. The beast let out a scream that still haunts my nightmares, a sound no living thing should ever make. As the flames engulfed the diner, I stumbled out into the parking lot. The creature, 
rebuked by the fire, screeched and retreated into an alley. My mind raced, trying to process what just happened. The fire raged and lit up the dark night. There wasn't a single soul on the streets, and no sirens wailed in the distance. Why isn't anyone coming? Is there anyone left besides us? I muttered under my breath. Determined not to sit and wait for help that might never come, I shouted to the others who'd made it out of the inferno. Look, we've got to stick together. We've got to keep moving. It's us against this thing. Shaky nods affirmed their agreement. Weaning off shock and taking stock of our condition, one of them suggested heading for a nearby police station only a few blocks away. We started walking and noticed our cell phones were not working, no service. Upon reaching the police station, dread sank in as we saw multiple patrol cars with open doors and signs of struggle scattered throughout the area. Fearing for our lives but needing help desperately, we cautiously entered the building. Inside, it wasn't any better. Papers lay scattered across desks while mutilated corpses dotted hallways and rooms. The grim air grew even heavier as everyone realized just how vast the creature's damage was. Despite our fears, we knew we had to find weapons to defend ourselves if there were any left in here. The search led us to a small armory with a few leftover firearms, not much but enough to give us hope. Armed and with no one else left to rely on but ourselves, we carefully formed a plan, not to take down this monster but to distract it long enough so that some of us could split up and gather help from neighboring towns. Our small group exited through a back door of the station, the air filling with silent prayers. We dispersed in a coordinated formation, rifles at the ready. Abruptly it emerged, bounding out of shadows. Its lanky frame, elongated limbs, and the deer skull head with sharp antlers only accentuated its otherworldly terror as it launched into an attack mode. Not wasting a moment, I took aim and fired a shot to get its attention. It flinched but immediately retaliated by lunging towards me. I backed away and continued firing as others did the same. The harsh screech intensified with each bullet finding its mark. A distraction achieved, two of our group rushed away through a side alley, their loud footsteps alerting the beast. In retaliation, it slammed one of our group members on the ground so viciously that I knew he wouldn't make it. Determined to evade capture, or worse, I swallowed my fear and heeded my fallen companion's sacrifice. We ran in separate directions, with each step feeling heavier than the last. We knew our odds of escaping alive were dwindling fast. The creature's grip on this town had taken its toll, families torn apart, lives brutally extinguished around every corner. Our split was risky as we had encountered more death than life so far, but it was our only chance for survival. Hours turned into days. Constant stress filled every moment while avoiding the creature capturing us became an excruciating challenge. Finally reunited by sheer coincidence with one of my fellow survivors near a riverbank leading out of town, battered and weary, mentally and physically, we noticed military personnel just ahead on the other side of the waterway. Adding every last bit of strength into our exhausted muscles, we crossed the river's freezing water. Reeling from hypothermia and fatigue sinking deeper into our cores, they finally took us in. We heard about a distress call sent out by one of your group members. We're here to help. One of the soldiers informed us, as we clung on to my remaining companion's survival. Our fight may have been over, but the horrors inflicted by the creature on our town could never be forgotten. We had lost so many— friends, family members, acquaintances, to this grotesque beast that had turned our lives into unimaginable nightmares. I remember settling in at Creekside Cabin, a quaint getaway nestled deep in the Appalachian Mountains, 
excited for a peaceful solo trip. As I unpacked my bags, I couldn't help but crack a joke to myself. It's just me and the squirrels this weekend. Little did I know what was waiting for me. Only hours after arriving, I found myself hiking through the dense forest, aiming to follow the trail that was rumored to lead to a stunning waterfall. My name is Silas Ellery, by the way. The air was fresh and crisp, a delightful break from the city smog I typically endure. Carefully stepping over twisted roots and scattered rocks, I couldn't shake off an eerie feeling of being watched. As dusk began to settle over the mountains, shadows lengthening before me with an unsettling quality, curiosity got the best of me. Venturing off the trail just a bit to examine my surroundings, I discovered remnants of what looked like a campsite, tattered clothes strewn about and abandoned camping gear scattered across the clearing. Unnerved yet intrigued, I picked up a piece of fabric, disgustingly soiled and torn, and felt shivers run down my spine. Unable to ignore the unfolding mystery before me, I knelt beside the scene to snap some photos with my phone when suddenly a nauseating stench filled the air, easily more repugnant than my Uncle Lester's dirty socks. My eyes widened as I stumbled on something buried beneath moldering leaves. A decaying hand appeared before me like one of those zombies from The Walking Dead. Panicked and stunned by this macabre discovery, clearly no laughing matter, I scrambled away from the sight and back towards the trail. As my heart pounded in my chest, racing faster than a cheetah chasing its prey, peculiar sounds began echoing through the forest. Thuds interspersed with what sounded like twisting branches echoed in the twilight making my unease grow exponentially. I didn't want to admit it, but I felt an instinctive need to call for help, as if some self-preservation switch had been flipped. However, years of conditioning myself to rely on my wit and independence made the idea of a distress call nearly impossible for my stubborn nature. Not only that, but the fact that I was in the heart of a remote area plagued by unreliable cell reception confirmed that I was utterly alone. My ears perked up as snapping twigs and rustling foliage grew louder with each passing minute. Approaching me was a creature unlike anything I'd seen before. Its frame was tall and lanky, limbs elongated to unnatural lengths, and a grotesque stag skull adorned its head, antlers sharp and menacing. As if time itself had slowed down, my mind raced to recall every detail of this nightmarish figure. From twisted muscles that flexed beneath its mottled flesh to the eeriness of its cold, dead eyes staring straight at me it was a true vision straight from hell. In that moment, instinct took over, flight trumping fight. Run! My internal voice screamed as loud as any air horn could possibly be. I bolted into the shadowy forest, feeling the creature's breath hot on my heels. With each stride I took, adrenaline surged through my veins as terror propelled me forward. Branches whipped against my face while twisted roots threatened to ensnare me with each desperate step. As I continued racing through the dark forest, I stumbled upon a small clearing. The light of the full moon gave me just enough visibility to notice an old cabin in the distance. My heart pounded in my chest as I tried to weigh my options quickly. I knew that calling for help was nearly impossible due to the poor cell reception. But I also knew that if I didn't at least try, I might not make it out of here alive. As I made my way to the cabin... I pressed my back against the decaying wood and carefully took out my phone, praying that somehow I'd have a signal. A miracle. There was a single bar of service. The moment it registered, my fingers dialed the emergency number and held my breath as it rang. 911, what's your emergency? The operator's voice was like a lifeline in these dire circumstances. I'm being chased. My words came out fast and frantic. There's some creature after me. Please send help. Before she could respond, a spine-chilling growl resonated behind me. 
the creature had found me again. With no time to waste, I shoved my phone back into my pocket and burst through the cabin door, quickly locking it behind me. Inside, cobwebs filled every corner while dust coated every surface. It looked like no one had set foot in here for years. The creature began pounding on the door. Each impact threatened to splinter it into pieces. In a last-ditch effort to protect myself, I found something heavy, an old iron poker from a nearby fireplace, and wedged it under the doorknob. For a moment, everything fell silent. Maybe the creature had given up? Then suddenly, the window shattered in an explosion of glass shards. It had found another way in. Spotting a back door, I sprinted towards it and flung it open, dashing back into the moonlit forest. The twisted trees and treacherous roots seemed to be guiding me deeper into this hellish landscape. As I ran, I heard the creature letting out guttural growls interspersed with agonizing screams. My lungs burned, and my legs ached, but there was no time to stop. In the distance, I spotted a cliff looming over me. It appeared to be the end of the line. Hesitating for only a moment, I made a decision. I climbed onto a nearby tree with every ounce of energy left in me. As I clung to a thick branch, masking my presence among the leaves, I held my breath and prayed for it not to discover me. The creature prowled below, sniffing and searching for any trace of me. But it was like some cunning side of me had risen in response to this horrifying situation, quirking my lips into a sinister grin as I quietly pulled a pocket knife from my pocket above it. Suddenly, sirens echoed in the distance. The operator must have tracked my call. Hearing them as well, the creature let out an ear piercing screech and retreated back into the shadows of the forest. I slid down from the tree as help finally arrived. Police officers stood before me with their weapons drawn but faltered when they saw just how badly shaken up I was. It would take hours for them to search the area, finding nothing but footprints and animal carcasses, before escorting me out of that wretched place called the forest. A few days later, life tried to return to normalcy, but how could it? The gruesome incident had shaken me to my core. And though I am still alive today and can thank that hidden part of myself that knew how to survive those horrifying moments, each memory sends shivers down my spine. As much as that night taught me not to underestimate my cunning instincts, it also constantly reminds me of the horrifying creature that may still be lurking in the depths and shadows, waiting for another unsuspecting soul to cross its path. I had this strange feeling in the pit of my stomach as I walked towards the old gas station. My name is Samuel Winscott, but friends call me Sam. It was getting late and my car was on its last fumes of gasoline. I needed a fill-up pronto. In hindsight, I should have stayed on the main highway, but a sense of curiosity guided me to this very remote area. The sun was setting in the western skies, casting an eerie orange glow. Why do I always manage to get myself into these situations? I muttered under my breath. Regardless, I continued toward the worn-down building with a painted sign above the door that read, Hauser's Gas and Grub. A bell rang somewhere inside as the door swung open. Welcome, said a heavy-set man behind the counter. He removed his cap and revealed an almost fully bald head. My name's Norman Hauser. Pleasure, I replied. Just passing through and need some gas. Norman gestured toward an old pump outside, which looked as though it had served its purpose since this place was opened. While starting to fill up my car outside, my attention shifted to a group of locals nearby whispering amongst themselves. A word caught my ear. Creature. The whispers became clearer as they told a story of this hideous beast that roamed around the area just beyond Hauser's gas and grub. 
Its description sent chills down my spine a tall, lanky frame with elongated limbs and a head resembling a deer or stag skull with sharp antlers. As frightening as it sounded, my skeptical nature attributed the tale to superstition or folklore among those living in remote places. You know, I called out jokingly to them. If you're trying to scare away your only customers. They laughed uneasily and returned to their hushed voices. I went inside and paid Norman for the gas. Hey, Norman, I asked, trying to mask my curiosity behind humor. Is this so-called creature giving you any trouble? Norman's forced laugh revealed a hint of nervousness. He leaned in closer and whispered, Them folks just love to gossip, but I'd be lying if I said some strange things haven't happened round here. As I stepped back into my now fully gassed car, Norman strangely added, Just keep your eyes open, and don't stray too far from the path. Driving away, I couldn't stop thinking about the warning. I turned on the radio for a distraction and soon came across a dark trail surrounded by thick woods on both sides. It seemed to beckon me towards it. Against my better judgment, I took a turn. The trail soon widened up into an abandoned logging site a few rusted trucks and piles of logs strewn about. An eerie feeling washed over me as the sun slipped beyond the horizon. Darkness swallowed everything in sight. Suddenly, crunching twigs echoed in the surrounding woods progressively getting louder. Straining my eyes, I saw an elongated shadow move among the trees. My heart raced as it became apparent that this was no human it was unmistakably the creature from earlier whispers. It burst from the brush wielding an old logging tool with malice in its ghastly eyes. Panic set in as I frantically tried to start my car engine while it continued its advance. Why didn't I call for help? I screamed within myself. But deep down, I knew there wasn't enough time. This thing was fast and ruthless. With the creature getting closer, and my car not starting, I knew I needed to think fast. I grabbed my phone and tried calling for help, but there was no signal. Cursing under my breath, I realized how foolish it would have been to rely on a phone in such a remote area. I glanced around the abandoned logging site, looking for any possible means to escape or hide. The creature was now only a few steps away, swinging the logging tool threateningly in its grasp. This entity with its deer or stag skull head with sharp antlers and elongated limbs emitted an aura of dread that made me want to cower and submit rather than fight or flee. Spotting a small, half-collapsed shack nearby, I decided that hiding was my best shot. I quickly scrambled out of my car's passenger side, hoping not to attract the creature's attention. Its focus momentarily shifted towards the car as it continued its menacing approach. I sprinted towards the shack and dove into a crevice created by the collapsed roof, praying that the creature would not notice my escape. Its haunting footsteps seemed to move closer and closer as I silently held my breath. The creature paused near the shack, seemingly considering if it had seen anything before eventually moving further down into the logging site. Its angry roars bounced off rusted machinery and decaying logs. It sounded both frustrated but still determined to find me. My heart pounded in my chest as sweat trickled down my forehead. The reality of what just happened hit me like a ton of bricks. This horrifying being had just nearly taken my life. It was only through pure luck that I evaded capture so far. I knew I couldn't stay in hiding forever. Mustering whatever courage remained inside me, I carefully crawled out from beneath the ruined shack when I felt confident that the creature was far enough away. Keeping low, I tiptoed back towards the path I had entered the logging site through, fearing any accidental noise would bring the monster back. Once I made it to my car, I tried the engine one more time. Miraculously, it started. I quickly drove away from the logging site, anguished cries of the creature echoing behind me. 
Despite my want to forget everything that had just occurred, I knew it was essential to share what had happened with someone. After hours of driving, I arrived at a small town where I was finally able to call for help. The police listened intently as I shared my harrowing story, and they decided that something needed to be done. They sent a team of officers and wildlife specialists to investigate the logging site and put up warning signs around the area in hopes of sparing others from experiencing what I went through. My experience left me constantly checking over my shoulder, even when surrounded by people. It took time for me to overcome my fear of ever encountering such an unspeakable horror again. Ultimately, the creature's existence remains unexplained, its motives and origins shrouded in mystery. It continues to haunt the logging site, leaving only gruesome reminders for those who dare venture too far into its hunting ground. And while it may not be a part of any folklore or urban legend, its terror is all too real for those who have encountered it. Because it's no myth or legend, this fiendish creature now exists in reality lurking in shadows and waiting for its next unfortunate victim. It all started with a joke. I never thought it would spiral into something out of a nightmare. My name is Harris Linden, and my buddies and I decided to take a trip to this old, abandoned asylum in Kentucky that people claimed was haunted. We didn't believe in any of the supernatural stories, but we had nothing better to do that weekend. Little did we know what awaited us. We reached the asylum in our pickup truck, marveling at its eerie and dilapidated state. Parts of the walls were crumbling down, and vines overtook the exterior like tentacles of an ancient beast. As we ventured inside, we could see graffiti coating some of the walls, remnants left by other explorers who had passed through here over the years. My friends Kester Tremaine and Tillman Banks accompanied me, laughing as we joked and walked down the dimly lit corridors with flashlights in our hands. As we explored more of the asylum, it was clear that it had been left untouched for quite some time, with dust covering every surface and bones scattered around from small animals that must have taken shelter here. We heard a strange noise coming from one of the rooms as we approached the end of a hallway. Was it your stomach, Tillman? Kester teased while pointing his flashlight at his friend. Tillman responded by laughing out loud and jokingly punching Kester in the arm. But soon enough, our laughter died down when we entered that room. The walls seemed damp like they were crying dark tears so slowly sinking into a pool on the floor. Amidst this decay stood an inexplicable sight. Wooden beams formed an odd structure that vaguely resembled an animal or creature. This thing had a tall, lanky frame with elongated limbs, which remained unnervingly still. As we looked closer at this recomposed figure, Kester remarked that its head appeared like a deer or stag skull with sharp antlers protruding from the top. Not expecting to see something so bizarre, we inspected the structure further. Suddenly, the skull's eyes glowed, and this uncanny beast came to life. It released a guttural, otherworldly sound and moved its limbs with alarming speed and agility. Stunned, we found ourselves unable to move as our flashlights danced in its glare. Dropping our flashlights out of sheer fear, we stumbled backward as this creature leaped forward, making it crystal clear that it wasn't here for pleasantries. Guys, run! I managed to yell, breaking free from my shock. Bolting through the hallway as fast as our legs could carry us, the agonizing screeches reverberated in our ears. The walls seemed to close in on us while the relentless creature chased into unexplored corners of the asylum. At some point, we decided to split up, hoping that one of us would find a way out and call for help. Heading down yet another forsaken corridor illuminated solely by my dying flashlight beam, 
I hear Tillman bellowing in pain his scream echoes through the halls like a haunting reminder of our impending doom. Anxiety swells within me my racing heart ready to burst from my chest. I sprint with reckless abandon and stumble upon an area filled with old medical equipment. I find a bottle of industrial alcohol and pocket it who knows when that might come in handy. Stagnant hospital air fills my lungs but there's no time to suffocate on it. I must keep moving. The creature stalked us relentlessly, not seeming to tire. We had split up, hoping that one of us might elude this uncanny beast and find a way to call for help. Its deer-like skull with sharp antlers gleamed in the darkness as its elongated limbs propelled it after me. I tried my best to recall if anywhere in the asylum there was a phone or radio we could use to contact the outside world, but my mind was blank. I heard another scream echoing through the abandoned asylum. This time it was Sarah, her voice filled with pain and horror. It made me feel helpless that I couldn't do anything for her. We had been so foolish coming here without telling anyone where we were going. No one knew where to find us. Running through the dark corridors, I spotted a staircase leading down to what looked like a basement level. Desperation urged me on as I hurried down the steps, praying that there would be some way out or something, anything that might be of help. At the bottom of the stairs was a large storage room filled with dusty boxes and old items. My flashlight flickered and went out, plunging me into near darkness. Groping around, I found an old set of walkie-talkies inside one of the boxes and turned them on. They crackled with static before one burst into life with Tillman's panicked voice. Hey! Are you guys still alive? I managed to evade that thing for a while, but it's only a matter of time before it finds me again. I found walkie-talkies. I responded, my urgent tones seeping through. We need to call for help somehow. Do any of you see any way out? I haven't yet, Tillman replied breathlessly. But I'll keep looking. We have to hurry. Sarah chimed in with strained determination so evident in her trembling voice. We can't let it find us again. Suddenly, I remembered the bottle of industrial alcohol in my pocket and had an idea. If we couldn't escape, at least we could confront the creature with something to fight back. Listen, guys, I said into the walkie-talkie. I have a bottle of industrial alcohol. If we can somehow set it on fire, maybe we can hurt that monster or buy us some precious time to escape. Sounds like our only plan so far. Tillman agreed over the crackling static. Let's all meet up in the main hall. We'll have more space to move around there and hopefully a better chance against this thing. As we congregated in the dimly lit main hall, our nerves frayed to their breaking point. I lit a rag stuffed into the industrial alcohol bottle with an old lighter I found in one of the dusty boxes. Suddenly, the guttural growl of the creature ripped through the atmosphere from a distance. It was closing in on us. Get ready. I whispered over the sounds of our rapid heartbeats and heavy breathing. It burst onto the scene moments later its grotesque form illuminated by our dying flashlights. It charged at us, but as it reached closer, I hurled our makeshift firebomb at the creature with all my strength. The flaming bottle connected squarely with its awful skull, setting it ablaze amid screams and screeches that filled our ears. Despite being on fire, it continued its relentless pursuit, though it now clearly stumbled in confusion and pain. Using this opportunity to our advantage, we scrambled out from a smashed window near a side exit that led out of this forsaken place. As soon as all three of us were safely outside, struggling for breath and tasting freedom from death's grip, Sarah dialed emergency services on her cell phone, finally realizing she hadn't lost it after all. The police and paramedics arrived and tended to our injuries. They conducted a search of the asylum but found no trace of the otherworldly entity. However, the traumatic events we had experienced still lingered, 
they were undeniable for us. We were alive, but our hearts bore the memories of this gruesome encounter with this eerie, mysterious creature. We could only hope that by some miracle we had seen the last of it. Last night, my friends and I found ourselves in an odd situation while driving through the remote woods of Vermont. At first, it seemed like a typical road trip exchanging stories and jokes, laughing and singing along to our favorite tunes as deep green foliage flew by. But many miles in, unease began to fester as shadows danced menacingly between the trees. My name is Elwood Tavish and along for the ride were Eustace Murgatroyd and Virgil Bixby. Eustace navigated as Virgil commandeered the wheel of our beat-up truck, traversing what seemed like endless miles of country roads. As evening darkened into night, we stumbled onto a clearing encircled by gnarled, twisted trees. The moonlight offered just enough illumination for us to make out their sinister silhouettes against the stark sky. We decided to stop there now deep within the odd territory so we could stretch our legs before proceeding with our journey. What would you do if a bear suddenly showed up right now? Virgil joked, trying to alleviate the unsettling atmosphere despite nervousness evident in his voice. I'd let old Slowpoke Eustace distract it. I snickered in response. Very funny. Eustace retorted with mock irritation as we continued on foot into the moon-kissed clearing. As we scanned the area, we heard an unfamiliar rustling in the shadows just beyond our visibility. Initially perceiving it as a trick of the wind or simply an animal going about its nocturnal business, we paid little heed until unexpected noises grew louder and more distinct. A deer-like creature emerged from behind a twisted tree. Yet this was no ordinary deer. It bore a semblance of normalcy, but something was off about its appearance. The frail entity possessed elongated limbs that arced at unnatural angles and boasted a head that evoked images of a stag skull, crowned with large, wickedly sharp antlers. We stood frozen in the face of this inexplicable being. Its presence alone was enough to paint screams on our faces which never manifested, as audible sound. As it drew nearer, each step made us shudder, its momentum increasing the tempo of our rising panic. Eustace whispered, Should we call for help? Virgil and I shot him an incredulous look. Our collective realization that no phone signal could be found here flushed his face red with embarrassment. Virgil and I braced ourselves to confront the creature while Eustace remained frozen and wide-eyed, gnawing on his fingernails as if wishing to fray them into non-existence. Exchanging a quick nod, we made our move. We lunged forward but saw that the creature had anticipated our intentions. In an instant, it slashed Virgil's arm with one of its grotesque talons that seemed almost human in their design. Blood splattered onto the earth as Virgil clenched his teeth in pain. Reacting to this shocking violation, I fumbled inside my jacket pocket for my pocket knife. The creature recoiled at the sight of it, seemingly on guard against its diminutive symbolism of danger. As the standoff intensified between me and the fiend, Virgil was left tending his bleeding arm with Eustace trying his best to offer support despite his own terror. The shrill ringing of Eustace's phone momentarily disrupted our focus as he realized he'd somehow regained signal. The ringing of Eustace's phone supplied us with a faint beacon of hope. The creature hesitated, seemingly distracted by the sudden noise, and I seized the opportunity to grab Virgil and Eustace by their collars to retreat further from danger. I instructed them to call for help while keeping my eyes firmly locked on our pursuer. Eustace dialed 911 frantically, and we listened to the operator's calm voice attempting to gather details about our situation. Between huffs, we informed her about our location and the unclear threat. The creature followed us at a distance, 
observing our every move without hesitation or fear. We need police. No, we need more than that. I stuttered into the phone. We're being attacked by an unidentified creature. What does it look like? asked the operator. It has a tall, lanky frame with elongated limbs. Its head looks like a deer or stag skull with sharp antlers. Eustace sputtered through his fingernails. Stay where you are. Help is on the way, the operator assured us. We found a nearby cave for temporary shelter as Virgil began losing blood at an alarming rate. Utilizing a torn shirt and water bottle as makeshift bandages and disinfectant, I tended to him cautiously. The moments crept on as we anticipated the arrival of any form of assistance. Meanwhile, the creature remained just outside the cave's entrance, not advancing but eyeing us with its skull-like visage. The assertive posture in its stance indicated a clear message. It was not to be underestimated or challenged. Hearing the distant sirens from approaching rescue vehicles momentarily eased our pounding hearts. However, they did not deter our predator. It continued lurking just beyond reach even when emergency workers arrived, fully armed and bewildered by what stood before them. The police fired volleys of bullets into the creature, but without success, it seemed impervious to their desperate assault. As the creature retaliated, it launched itself toward the officers with a swift vengeance. Its terrifying talons tore through their uniforms, rendering them helpless against its onslaught. The gathered crowd of onlookers gasped as their protectors seemingly vanished under the fierce attack. We all panicked about what these morbid events could signify. Yet, almost as though it considered the job finished, the creature halted its rampage and skulked back into the forest with chilling composure. What comes next for us? Eustace whimpered, casting his pale gaze in our direction. I, too, questioned my ability to protect anyone during this seemingly supernatural confrontation. Surrounded by grieving family members and dreading what may lie ahead of us, a feeling of complete dread washed over Virgil and me. The memory of those who had fallen haunted our thoughts. Brave defenders who paid a gruesome price for engaging an unknown enemy that struck from within the shadows. We knew that we carried scars that could never heal and that our lives would never return to normalcy after this. In quiet contemplation, we gathered ourselves and mustered every ounce of strength to face each passing day. The world didn't seem quite so secure anymore, knowing that such creatures existed outside our realm of understanding, but they remained undeterred as testament to our resilience. We would march on, no longer burdened by naivete or an illusion of safety surrounding us, but driven by a newfound determination to persevere despite encountering monsters in our midst. Society at large may never be ready for these sinister beings that dwell beyond humanity's comprehension. However, those who survived their attacks would bear witness to the dark reality where horror seeped into everyday life. Though we could not comprehend the creature's motivations or origins completely, we emerged with increased clarity about ourselves. Our scars were now eternal reminders of that harrowing experience, reminding us to respect the hidden dangers lurking outside our peripheral vision and to cherish those precious memories spent with fallen heroes who sacrificed all for their fellow man. I still remember the unsettling adventure by the lake with a shiver down my spine. I had just moved into Ridgemont, a small isolated town hidden away in Minnesota. To celebrate my newfound independence, I decided to take a solo trip to Foxtail Lake, famous for its mesmerizing beauty and peaceful landscape. Little did I know that my visit there would turn into something that still haunts my dreams. The sun had already set when I first set foot on the shores of the lake. The water was calm and soothing, reflecting the fading light as day succumbed to night. It didn't take much time for me to set up camp and light a fire, 
drawing warmth from its dancing flames. As dusk turned to night, I started humming to pass the time while roasting marshmallows. My rusty guitar skills gave rise to a charming melody that seemed to harmonize with the serene landscape. Almost absentmindedly, I glanced around the forest and noticed something odd an oddly shaped tree, no rather a tall lanky figure standing close by. Curiosity peaked. I decided to approach it carefully. It towered over me with its elongated limbs casting eerie shadows on the ground. To my shock and horror, it wasn't a tree at all but rather an abnormal creature unlike anything I had ever seen before. Its head resembled a deer or stag skull with menacingly sharp antlers atop it. Panic surged through me as the reality of this unknown being presented itself before me far from camp and any help whatsoever. My instincts told me to run. However, calling for help seemed futile as not a soul could hear in this remote location. Are you lost too? A voice unexpectedly interrupted my train of thought. Not from the unnatural creature before me but from another person who approached behind me. He introduced himself as Jasper Kalash. He was an experienced hunter who, like me, had stumbled upon the creature by accident. While the initial shock of our interaction brought us unexpected comic relief and a few jokes along the way, our attention soon fell back on the fearsome and spine-chilling being whose stark presence towered ominously above both of us. Time was of the essence, and Jasper and I decided it was best to retreat without alerting this seemingly dangerous creature. But as we backed away slowly and discreetly, we suddenly heard its low guttural growl. Panicking, we dared not even breathe. The creature's limbs moved sporadically after that thrashing against trees and stomping in violent agitation. Our hearts pounding in our chests, we scurried through the dense forest with no time to think as the monstrosity pursued us relentlessly. Jasper whispered through gritted teeth breathlessly that he never encountered anything like this before and couldn't risk contacting anyone for fear of putting them in danger as well. It seemed our only option was to fight or elude this abomination. Tears streaming down my face from fear and unsteady breathing, I caught a glimpse of a fallen tree up ahead as an improvised barricade to hide behind, just long enough to rethink our strategy. We couldn't outrun it forever. Jasper reluctantly came to terms with our reality and handed me his hunting rifle. Lights flashed before my eyes. The creature's limbs tore through branches like knives through butter. It shrieked in agony as I fired shots into its already gored body, but its pursuit seemed endless despite entering a new wave of torment. In that very moment, I knew we had to put more distance between us and this horrifying creature. With sheer determination, Jasper and I sprinted further into the forest, weaving through the trees and hoping that our persistence would eventually pay off. Out of breath, we reached a rushing river. The water seemed to offer our best chance at escape, even if it meant risking hypothermia. Looking at each other for a brief moment of confirmation, we dove headfirst into the cold currents. As we swam, our exhaustion made each stroke more difficult and our muscles burned under the strain. But the bone-chilling water did little to stem the terror that gripped both of us. The thought of what lurked behind us was enough motivation to keep pushing onward. Reaching the other side of the river, we pulled ourselves ashore. Desperate for help, I tried activating my smartphone's GPS signal but there was no service in these isolated woods. Realizing that manually searching for a cell signal would be too risky and time-consuming, we proceeded to follow the riverbank in hopes of finding civilization. We stumbled upon a small town further downriver after several exhausting hours. Relieved to finally reach safety, we found the local police station. We burst through the entrance taking no time to explain the nightmare that had unfolded within the nearby woods. The officers listened in disbelief but agreed to investigate after witnessing our distress and genuine fear. 
A search party was immediately assembled and sent to inspect the area where our ordeal had occurred. Meanwhile, Jasper and I were taken to a nearby motel where we were able to shower and find some rest. The following day, an officer from the station approached us both with grim news. They had discovered evidence of a violent struggle, broken trees, heavily trampled ground, and bloodstains scattered about yet failed to find any trace of the creature itself. It took days for Jasper and me to recover physically even longer for our minds to begin to process the events that nearly cost us our lives. The townspeople treated us kindly during our stay, discussing the strange occurrence and sharing similar stories from their community's past. Relative safety allowed family members to arrive and provide support. Yet despite their love, either of us would ever be quite the same again. As we said our goodbyes and vowed never to return, we each silently acknowledged our luck in escaping that horrifying monstrosity lurking deep within the woods. Throughout the years that have followed, Jasper and I continue to discuss our nightmare. Unease still lingers within us both, forever haunted by the knowledge that somewhere out there, it remains alive awaiting its next unsuspecting victims. We feel an inexplicable bond with this small town, stemming from a shared terror of something unfathomable yet undeniably real. So while life marches on, and we regain some semblance of normality, this chilling experience will forever echo through our thoughts. But one must live and look forward without dwelling too much on horrors that cannot be changed or undone. Because in truth, as long as this creature continues to exist somewhere out there, fear will forever be lurking in the dark recesses of existence. I was never the superstitious type, but the things that happened one evening out in the wilds of rural Nebraska changed everything for me. My name is Augustus McMillan, and I'm a traveling salesman peddling sewing machines to hard-working homemakers. So there I was, driving my trusty 1955 Ford Fairlane on the lonesome stretch of Highway 20, an otherwise uninteresting day. The sun had begun its slow descent on the horizon as I pulled into the driveway of Bert Worthington, my first and last client for the day. After a long, tiresome day of pitching products to uninterested folks, I regaled him with tales of my trip thus far, about a rooster that tried to take over an entire hen house in Iowa and how Bert would need a sewing machine to stitch up his farmer's overalls after rolling around laughing. After a successful sale and some coffee cake to take on my drive back, I thanked Bert for his hospitality and continued down that lonely highway. Night had fallen fast as clouds began to envelop the now-obscured moon. No signs of civilization in sight. My eyes felt weary and heavy with fatigue. To keep myself awake, I contemplated jokes so foolish that it ticked my mind with chuckles. Out of nowhere, something caught my attention and broke my sleepy stupor. The distinct scent of sulfur hung heavily in the air. Peering into the darkness as if my eyes could pierce through it, I began scanning for any signs of animals or beasts unknown to me. My heart was pounding out of my chest. I parked near an old abandoned farmhouse whose mysterious allure heightened by its decaying facade seemed somehow enticing to me at that moment. Despite every telling bone inside me warning against the dreaded consequences that awaited this foolish move, I decided to come out from the cloistered comfort of my car. Treading cautiously, I stepped inside the decaying house. The floorboards creaked and complained with every shift of my weight. The walls groaned a sad lament of a house long forgotten. Guided by moonlight streaming through broken windows, I crept silently further in. There, in the dim light cast by the moon overhead, I saw it, the creature. Tall and ominous, its lanky frame filled the room. The creature's elongated limbs twitched as if it sensed my arrival. 
It had the trunk of a beast and an eerie skull resembling that of a deer or stag adorned with razor-sharp antlers crowning its despicable head. A chill ran down my spine. I stood there, dumbstruck, not knowing what to do or think when suddenly this vile being swung its hideous antlers and charged at me with great ferocity. The time between that very moment seemed to stretch on infinitely in slow motion as I imagined the impending doom that loomed in front of me. Mustering up whatever ounce of courage my body housed adjunct to fear, I lunged to my left just barely avoiding those lethal appendages attached to the monster's recoiling skull. My legs buckled beneath me as shock-filled adrenaline propelled me back toward the threshold. I ran out into the night leaving my car behind under some pretext of intuition or a premonition that would divulge itself later on without care at present as survival seemed to be on priority. Heart racing, I continued sprinting through the dense underbrush unsure what direction held safety but away from where risk lied in wait. The dissonant chorus produced from squelching sloppy mud obstacles that threatened to topple me over as I hasted away was intermittently punctuated by hoots and shrills from owls perched high atop trees and hiding behind cover similar to mine. Fueled by fear alone, I charged onwards into the dark void, my only aim being to escape from the hell spawn that hunted me. As I trudged through the dark forest, the sounds of rustling leaves deafened by my pounding heart. I scanned my surroundings for any sign of the vicious creature. The gnarled trees provided shadowy alleys for it to lurk in, waiting to strike again. Thoughts raced through my mind, each more frightening than the last. Should I call the police? They wouldn't believe me. They'd think I had lost my mind or was pulling a sick prank. I heard a horrifying screech echo through the trees, chilling me to the bone. Pausing momentarily, I realized that there was a dim light flickering in the distance. A stranger's house, perhaps? It was my only chance at finding refuge and assistance. Summoning all my strength, I ran towards the light. As I approached, I could make out that it was an old wooden cabin with a small porch out front. Praying that whoever lived there would offer refuge from the nightmarish creature lurking in the woods, I pounded on the door frantically. The sound of footsteps approached from within, and an old man cautiously opened the door. Help! There's something chasing me! I cried, desperation clear in my voice. The old man looked into my eyes and without a word pulled me inside. He locked and barricaded the door grabbing a large hunting rifle from above his fireplace. "'What is it chasing you?' he asked urgently. I described the creature to him as clearly as I could, a tall entity with elongated limbs and a head resembling a deer skull adorned with razor-sharp antlers. He listened intently before putting one hand on his chin, deep in thought. "'I've heard stories about this creature since I was a boy,' he said gravely. It's been terrorizing these woods for decades but never dared to hurt anyone until now. We heard something scratching at the door, trying to break in. The old man raised his rifle, aiming at the door. Whatever happens, stay behind me, he advised firmly. With a loud crash, the door burst open. There stood the creature, glaring at us with its hollow eyes. It lunged toward us its elongated limbs clawing through the air. The old man fired his rifle towards it, but the creature moved with such swiftness that it dodged every shot. As it got closer, I saw that its hideous form was covered in dripping blood from previous victims. The gruesome sight only fed my terror. The creature grabbed the old man with one of its limbs and tossed him across the room like a ragdoll. It then turned its gaze to me, snarling menacingly as it prepared to pounce. In an act of desperation, I grabbed a piece of wood from beside me and swung at it with all my remaining strength. Miraculously, the blow connected with its skull-like head. The creature shrieked in pain and stumbled backward. Seizing this window of opportunity, I sprinted towards the back door and bolted into the night. I didn't dare look back as I ran 
my heart pounding harder than ever. My only hope was to get as far away from that monstrous creature as possible. Hours later and exhausted beyond belief, I stumbled upon a road leading to a small town. The sun was beginning to rise, playing its immaculate and merciful role of casting away demons and their ilk that go bump in the night. As I reached civilization and found help from local residents who allowed me to use their phone, I learned that authorities soon discovered the cabin where we encountered the creature. They found no trace of it, but they did find what remained of the old man's body, torn apart by something so ferocious yet unknown. The haunting memories of that night would stay with me forever, but one thought offered me a small semblance of solace. I somehow managed to escape the insatiable bloodlust of that horrifying creature that once stalked me. And with every sunrise and every safe night henceforth, I would offer a word of gratitude, knowing that for today at least I lived. I woke up feeling an odd sensation that I might not be completely alone. Glancing around, I found myself surrounded by the less-traveled wilderness of Lilydale, a quaint town in the beautiful state of New York. My name is Ezra Stetler, and this was to be my weekend retreat, an escape from the city and a chance to reconnect with nature. Little did I know how unforgettable this trip would become. The first day followed the expected path, setting up camp, hiking through woods, and making a joke or two about being miles away from civilization. The isolation was indeed welcome, and there was comfort in knowing that cell phone signals couldn't find me here. While prepping dinner over an open fire, I heard rustling nearby. Squinting into the fading sunlight filtering through trees, I spotted a few feet away what looked like a deer carcass, twisted unnaturally in the underbrush. Its limbs bent at odd angles and punctures adorned its lifeless body. Disturbed by my find, I mentioned it over the crackling radio to the park ranger station. A friendly voice responded as Lorraine, who reassured me that scavengers were common in these parts. We shared a quick laugh over a joke about how we both preferred staying out of their way. That night, sleep eluded me as unsettling images of the deer returned unbidden. It was then that I first heard the distant crunching of fallen leaves' heavy steps echoing through eerily quiet woods. Dawn offered its tranquil respite but didn't completely settle my nerves. As I explored further into Lily Dale's heart, I encountered numerous strangely distorted animal remains, birds with broken wings splayed beneath tree branches and squirrels mangled near burrow entrances. The discoveries painted an unsettling pattern spreading far beyond mere scavenging. A gnawing unease pierced my thoughts but dissipated with each joke shared between Lorraine and myself over the radio. Our interactions gifting a sense of normalcy amid the chilling finds. As twilight approached, I felt a peculiar dread when spying another mangled carcass, this time a wild rabbit twisted in grotesque fashion. Fresh blood stained its fur, instilling urgency in my decision to report the finds to Lorraine. With increasing concern, we discussed hiking out and getting help from local authorities. Night fell heavily as I retraced my steps with flashlight in hand, struggling to navigate the now unfamiliar wilderness. The once welcoming isolation grew menacing with every snap of a twig and unsettling rustle nearby. My pulse quickened upon catching sight of distant shadows moving unnervingly quiet among forested terrain. Huddled by my campfire seeking solace in its warm glow, my radio crackled back to life as Lorraine's disturbed voice shared news of others discovering grotesque animal remains in different locations across the park. Clustered around the fire for protection— we found ourselves discussing our situation when suddenly interrupted by heavy footsteps nearing our camp. Words stuck in our throats as a monstrous creature emerged from the darkness into our firelight, tall and spindly like a warped marionette on elongated limbs. 
Its head seemed akin to an unholy cross between stag skull and deer head, antlers as sharp and menacing blades surrounding hollow eye sockets that peered directly into our souls. Lunging at us with frightening speed, its antlers clashed together with terrifying intensity. In desperation, I scrambled through my pack for anything resembling a weapon, my hands shaking uncontrollably as they wrapped around my father's old hunting knife, while Lorraine struggled with loading her grandfather's trusty shotgun beside me. As we prepared ourselves, the creature lunged at us again, the force of its attack causing us to scatter in different directions. I managed to keep hold of my father's hunting knife while Lorraine held on to her shotgun. The others in our group were armed with whatever they could find, rocks, sticks, and even a camera tripod. With each step, the creature relentlessly pursued us. Our only hope was to try and buy enough time for someone to call for help. I knew we had limited options as the park was in a remote area with spotty mobile reception. When we reached a spot where a few of us momentarily caught a signal, we dialed for help, struggling to explain the horror we were facing without sounding utterly insane. As the calls connected, we continued running in an attempt to stay ahead of this monstrous being. It picked off some of our group one by one, impaling them on its razor-sharp handlers and leaving their mutilated bodies behind. Their screams echoed through the forest. Eventually, it caught up to Lorraine and me. Adrenaline coursed through our veins as we looked for any advantage we could find against this terrifying villain. Lorraine fired two rounds at the creature's grotesque head before it took notice of her presence. To my horror, it suddenly lunged towards her, antlers raised with murderous intent. Instinctively, I threw myself between them and jabbed my knife into one of its twisted limbs. Though it didn't seem affected by pain, my action bought us a few precious seconds. Lorraine, run! Get help! I yelled out as she hesitated. Take care of yourself! Lorraine responded with fearful determination before fleeing in search of reinforcements. Left alone against such a formidable adversary, I focused on evading its vicious attacks and hoped that help would arrive soon enough, praying that Lorraine was successful in her pursuit. As I ran, I realized the creature was leading me towards even more macabre scenes of carnage. It was clear it was both toying with me and showing off its grisly work. I tried to shut out the horrific sights around me and concentrate on staying alive. Exhausted and running on pure resolve, I nearly collapsed when the sound of distant sirens reached my ears. The local authorities, accompanied by park rangers, appeared in the vicinity, quickly surrounding the area. Upon their arrival, the creature retreated into the shadows, leaving me bloodied and broken but still alive. Though we had lost friends in this frightening ordeal, Lorraine came back with help, our gamble paying off just enough to keep us alive. The police and ranger investigation yielded little in terms of answers. The creature vanished as quickly as it appeared, leaving behind only a trail of corpses and unanswered questions as to what it was or where it came from. Unable to link anything supernatural with our attacker, it seemed destined to remain an unsolved mystery. In the days following our escape, we mourned those who had fallen, their names etched into our hearts forever. While I recovered from my injuries, Lorraine stayed close, supporting each other through days filled with nightmares. We know that something ancient and terrifying wanders that park now, a shadow amidst the trees waiting for its next unsuspecting prey. But without any explanation of its origin or purpose, we hold on to each other, grateful for our survival against such a merciless beast. Attempting to move on from our brush with death, we remain cautious and fearful as we venture near any wilderness ever again. I remember the day quite clearly, standing outside the gas station on the outskirts of Dawson Springs, Kentucky. 
A long drive through unfamiliar territory lay ahead. My name is Soren Feldman, and I was visiting a friend's cabin for some much-needed relaxation. A subtle joke echoed in my head about how I needed a break from my boring everyday life. The journey began with a stop at Waller's Market to stock up on supplies. In a town where everyone knew each other, it was only natural to strike up conversations with the locals. They regaled me with tales of their hunting expeditions. Delving into stories about strange encounters in the woods near my destination, I listened half-heartedly because skepticism ran deep within me. Having traveled for most of the day, it was dusk when I arrived at the cabin. The cool night air and solitude were refreshing compared to city life. Settling down for a quiet dinner, something felt amiss like watching eyes from a distance. Unnerved by this irrational sensation, I quickly finished my meal and locked up for the night. Sleep came uneasily that night as my mind raced with half-remembered tales from those local hunters. Each noise seemed heightened due to my heightened state of anxiety. Yet no nightmare could prepare me for what awaited outside when daylight broke. Morning brought an unpleasant discovery. My car tires were shredded beyond repair, rendering any escape attempts futile. Focusing on the situation at hand, I set out on foot towards civilization. Over time, the trek through rugged terrain grew increasingly unbearable as exhaustion seeped in like an uncontrollable force. Finally resting beneath a large oak tree, I pondered my predicament while absent-mindedly doodling stick figures in the dirt. A snapping twig alerted me to an intruder, but swung around to face something beyond belief. Standing before me was a creature akin to nothing I had ever seen. Its tall, lanky frame supported elongated limbs that could easily reach an unsuspecting victim. Atop its elongated neck perched a deer skull, complete with sharp, jagged antlers. In broad daylight, it was impossible to deny this creature's existence. A primal terror coursed through me as it studied me with hollow eyes. This was no familiar hunter's tale from Waller's Market. This genuine horror stood just a few feet away. Fumbling with my pocket knife as my hands trembled uncontrollably, I scrambled to find an escape route. The creature seemed to be observing with curiosity rather than aggression at the moment. Suddenly and unexpectedly, the creature let out an ear-piercing shriek which only served to heighten the sense of dread I willed myself to continue on, knife still in hand, my body urging me to flee with every fiber of my being. Heaving under the weight of exhaustion and terror, I ran tirelessly in search for help or refuge. Stumbling upon a narrow path leading to an old shack offered temporary sanctuary from the horrors that pursued me. Yet relief was short-lived as unsettling thoughts swarmed my mind like a growing storm. A muffled cry in the distance further fueled the chaos within me. Was it another unfortunate soul tormented by this fearsome beast? Or perhaps a cruel joke orchestrated by some twisted force? Gathering courage amid countless unanswered questions, I forged on despite encroaching darkness and fatigue gnawing at my resolve like hungry wolves following prey. As I hid in the decrepit shack, I noticed a landline phone on a dusty wooden table. It seemed almost like a miracle, but I couldn't be sure whether it would even work. With the contradicting sensations of hope and dread, I cautiously reached for it and dialed 911. 911, what's your emergency? The operator answered. You need to send help immediately. There is... There is something chasing me. I stammered, unable to describe the monstrosity that pursued me. Please calm down, sir. Can you tell us your location? The operator asked seemingly unfazed. I'm not exactly sure where I am, but there's a path leading to an old shack. Please hurry. My voice broke as panic rushed through me. We'll trace your call and send help right away. Stay on the line, the operator instructed with urgency in her voice. 
As moments ticked by, I heard a guttural growl from outside the shack. The creature had found me. In desperation, I pushed a heavy cabinet against the door and prayed it would keep the beast at bay. Crash! The antlered abomination slammed into the door repeatedly, its jagged appendages piercing through the thin wood like knives through paper. Time was running out. The landline slipped from my hands as terror consumed me. However, deep within my being, survival instincts kicked in. I frantically searched for a possible exit or weapon but found nothing substantial, just rusty nails and broken boards strewn across the cold ground. Blood dripped onto the floor as sharp splinters pierced my hands in my desperate search. However, they were nothing compared to what was coming for me. In one final push, the monstrosity broke through the barricade, tearing at anything that obstructed its path with powerful limbs and antlers dripping with droplets of blood. No! Leave me alone! I screamed, stumbling back and tripping over a loose board. The sheer terror in my cry seemed to distract the creature just long enough to glance out at the distance. Moments after, sirens wailed in the background like a particularly sweet symphony unveiling itself around me. With one intense, blood-curdling screech, the creature darted away from the shack and into the dark abyss of the woods. And just like that, it was gone. Relieved beyond measure, I sought solace in the arrival of law enforcement, a squad of heavily armed police accompanied by search dogs and several armed officers. I relayed my experience with wide-eyed bewilderment as they took me towards their vehicles for questioning and safety. As we left behind those miles of dense forest devoid of happy memories, and though an investigation prompted by my pleas yielded few clues, the existence of the sinister creature began to haunt nearby townsfolk with sporadic sightings and chilling encounters. But whoever dared cross its path discovered too late that sheer horror was even closer, as a relentless undercurrent shaping our most profound fears. While authorities hunt this terrible beast, hope slips further away as if swallowed by those very same woods hiding their darkest secret. Life may never return to normal with such an abomination lurking just around the bend. For some, my story is whispered as cautionary words that serve as ominous reminders of unknown evils ripped from innocents' lives without warning or reason. For me, I shudder at each howl echoing through the night, knowing that every bush I pass may conceal emboldened fan limbs poised to strike. And whenever I remember those empty sockets of a gruesome deer skull locked onto me filled with sinister intent, part of me chokes on reality's newfound taste while grappling with unimaginable nightmares devouring reason whole, one antlered monster at a time. It all started when I lost my wallet while hiking alone in the remote wilderness of the Appalachian Trail. My name is Elias Townsend. Normally, I wouldn't worry about such a minor inconvenience, but my credit cards, cash, and most importantly, my ID were gone. I knew it would be a pain when I returned to civilization, but for now, all I could do was laugh at my carelessness and continue forward. As I pushed through the dense foliage, the sun began to set. The once picturesque scenery began transforming into shadowy figures looming before me. The chirping of birds slowly changed into sinister whispers carried by the soft breeze. Realizing that I didn't want to be stuck in this creepy forest after dark, I quickened my pace. A couple of hours later, I came across an abandoned log cabin a rare relic within the vast wilderness. The presence of an old structure was unexpected but certainly welcome as it gave me something to joke about to myself. At least this isn't one of those horror movies where they stumble upon an abandoned cabin in the woods, right? Little did I know that there was more truth to my jest than I could ever have imagined. Inside the cabin... I found traces of makeshift furniture 
and a cold fireplace covered in soot. Struggling to keep my eyes open, I decided to build a fire and rest until morning. Not long after falling asleep, though, I was awakened by peculiar scratching sounds coming from outside the cabin walls. At first, it seemed like just another creepy nocturnal visitor trying their luck on a defenseless hiker. That's what you get hiking alone unprepared. Curiosity consumed me as the noise grew louder and closer. Peering through a gap in one of the wood panels, utterly shocked by what faced me tall and grotesque with elongated limbs that seemed impossible under biological laws, its head adorned with sharp antlers, mimicking the shape of a deer skull. As it walked in a twisted, unnatural gait around the cabin, my heartbeat quickened, and I subconsciously held my breath. Surely this was one of those wild hallucinations they warn you about in survival shows? But the nightmare before me was unmistakable. Around the same time that desperation started creeping in, I remembered my smartphone. I could try to call for help. But with no signal and only 10% battery left, what good would it do? Frustration welled up inside me as I had willingly brought myself into this situation with per planning and now banking on someone else to save me. Waiting for the creature to leave felt like an eternity. When finally there was no sign or sound of it, I cautiously stepped out, armed with a broken branch and dwindling courage. The forest appeared normal again perhaps the monster was just a figment of my overactive imagination. I decided to make my way back to the trail and continue searching for help while clutching my makeshift defense weapon. The sun pierced through the trees, giving off an eerie golden glow that seemed to be mocking me as if nature itself had conspired against my fate. As the day progressed, the tranquility of nature returned, making it difficult to digest what I had seen earlier. Was that creature really roaming these woods? Backtracking along the path towards civilization still held uncertainties. Each rustle in the underbrush brought me closer to panicking but also edged on a comical dread. You know you're losing it when you start making jokes about a thing because you can't handle what you saw. And laughter began bubbling inside. It wasn't long before I found myself face to face with the abomination once more. Emerging from undergrowth, like some twisted fairy tale creature brought to life by evil forces, it sauntered forward each long stride in exercise and physical agony. Its deer like features froze within proximity, and for the first time, I tried to gain some sense as to what it was doing. I couldn't waste any more time trying to comprehend this unnatural being. My instincts urged me to escape and to find help. In a split second, I turned on my heels and sprinted in the opposite direction. Dread filled my chest as I heard it following me, its heavy steps cracking branches and crunching leaves on the forest floor. I pushed myself harder, feeling the burning in my muscles. My breath was ragged, and sweat soaked my clothes. Suddenly I stumbled and fell to the ground with a hard thud, pain shooting through my entire body. Ignoring the pain, I forced myself up and attempted to put more distance between that creature and me. But with each step I took, it only got closer. I soon realized that running would be insufficient to save me from its clutches. A quick glance around revealed a large tree with thick branches. It was risky, but it was all I had. Pushing my exhausted body toward the tree, I began to climb as fast as my jittery limbs would allow. As I clambered higher into the tree's safety, it let out a guttural growl that shook me to the core. But despite its horrific form, it could not appear to climb or follow me upwards. Feeling a slight flicker of relief, I mustered up enough courage to shout for help, hoping someone could hear me amidst this dreadful forest. Help! Can anybody hear me? Help! My voice echoed through the woods. Desperate pleas went unanswered. The creature let out another monstrous snarl. Frustration was evident in its movements as it paced back and forth beneath the tree. 
now was perhaps my only chance, while it was momentarily vexed, to call for help again. Please, somebody! Is anyone out there? My voice broke as fear chased any hope away. Unexpectedly, I heard a faint sound of footsteps approaching. My heart raced, torn between joy at the prospect of help and dread that they too might fall victim to this abomination. Hey! Up here! It was the first time I dared to look down the tree. I caught a glimpse of a figure. It appeared human, perhaps someone who could help me. But as the figure emerged from the shadows, my heart sank. It wasn't alone. Several other creatures like the one below me flanked the newcomer. I could see each one more terrifying than the last all with gruesome features. The person didn't stand a chance against such an army of monstrosities. In a flash, I knew what I had to do, warn them before it was too late. Stop! Run! There are dangerous creatures here! I practically screamed down to them. The encroaching group halted, most of them hesitating while others observing their surroundings with visible fear and confusion. A shared plan took form among them as they turned and sprinted away from the horrifying scene, leaving me alone again with my nightmare. Time seemed to stand still while I hung on to the tree, praying those creatures wouldn't return. Darkness crept in as night enveloped the forest, swallowing any remaining light. Hours bled into each other and at last, groggy and numb from my ordeal on the tree, daylight seeped through leaves canopy above me. Cautiously climbing down when there were no signs of those horrific beings, I felt an overwhelming urge to find my way back home, wherever that was. This nightmare had to end. Before leaving, I solemnly thought about those strangers who encountered unspeakable terror because they heard my cries for help. Reflecting on their bravery and sacrifice fueled determination in my exhausted body. On shaking legs, I made my way toward civilization through that once tranquil forest now haunted by secrets best left untold never looking back. I never thought something like this would happen to me especially in this quiet little town called Bakersfield. My name's Darius Jennings. I was at the local gas station filling up my car when I overheard two people, Lyle and Eloise, discussing some strange sightings in the woods. Their faces were serious, but I couldn't help but chuckle at the absurdity of it all. I mean, come on. You're telling me there's some creepy creature stalking our town? What is this, a horror movie? I asked with a laugh. Lyle remained stoic and replied, It's no laughing matter, Darius. This thing, whatever it is, has killed livestock and terrorized folks who went near the woods. Intrigued but still skeptical, I decided to investigate the woods myself on the following weekend. Armed with a flashlight and wearing boots for trudging through underbrush, I ventured into the dense forest on what began as a beautiful crisp fall day. As I walked deeper into the woods, the sunlight filtering through the trees diminished until I finally resorted to using my flashlight. Suddenly, I heard a sharp snap that made me freeze in my tracks brushing off that initial fear with a joke to myself. Great. Now I'm going to find Bigfoot or something. Trying to shake off my nervousness. I continued cautiously, noting strange markings along tree trunks they almost resembled claw marks. The further I went along the path, even more bizarre occurrences appeared, carcasses of different animals found mangled beyond recognition but seemingly not consumed as food. Eventually, feeling uneasy and disoriented by all these odd sights on this rapidly darkening afternoon, I decided it was time to turn back towards the safety of town. As if on cue, an ear-piercing howl echoed through the air causing me to shiver involuntarily. Telling myself it was just the wildlife in the woods, I picked up my pace. But then I heard rustling in the bushes nearby. 
I peered into the darkness with my flashlight, hoping to allay my fears. What I saw will haunt me forever. The creature stood on two legs, towering above me with its lanky frame and elongated limbs. Its head was a monstrous fusion of a deer skull with razor-sharp antlers that glinted like blades in my flashlight beam. Despite seeing it clear as day, I couldn't accept this nightmarish vision as reality. This must be some kind of elaborate hoax or messed-up prank. I muttered, trying to rationalize the situation. But then it started moving towards me, each step unnervingly measured as it closed the distance between us. My body betrayed me. Fear had taken full control. My heartbeat quickened to an almost painful rate as I backed away from this horrifying creature, stumbling over a root and sprawling onto my back. It didn't flinch when my flashlight beam hit its face, as if devoid of any human-like reaction or emotion. The creature continued advancing on me when suddenly a thought crossed my mind. Why haven't I tried calling for help? Frantically retrieving my phone from my pocket, I realized there was no signal in this remote area. My mistake. Perhaps only one option remained, fight back. Mustering every ounce of courage within me, I grabbed a hefty branch that fell nearby and swung it with all my might at the creature's head. It recoiled for a split second before snarling and lunging at me with renewed ferocity. The creature lunged at me just as I managed to strike it with the branch, only partially slowing it down. I scrambled to my feet and bolted deeper into the woods, hoping against reason that I could outrun it. My breathing became labored, but I dared not slow down. The snapping of branches behind me suggested I was being pursued. Panic set in as I realized that the creature seemed unaffected by my attack. At one point during this seemingly endless chase, I recalled spotting an old cabin earlier in my hike. Desperate for any form of shelter from this relentless predator, I changed course towards where I believed the cabin to be. After what felt like an eternity, the cabin came into view up ahead. As I stumbled through its creaking doorway, my legs threatened to give out beneath me. The cabin was in disrepair, cobwebs hung from every corner and rotten floorboards cracked underfoot. Even though it provided little protection against the powerful beast chasing me, perhaps it would buy me precious seconds to think of a plan. Suddenly, there was a crashing sound from just outside the cabin. Peering out the broken window, I saw it that twisted fusion of bones and antlers looming closer and closer. It stood at least twelve feet tall with its menacing presence. I searched the musty cabin for anything that could be used as a weapon or tool for defense. As luck would have it, there was an old hunting rifle on a dusty shelf, likely left by previous occupants who fled in haste. I grabbed the rifle and checked for ammunition. Much to my relief, there were still three bullets left in its chamber. However, my fingers shook uncontrollably with fear threatening my aim. The creature began clawing at the cabin walls, causing nails and debris to rain down upon me from its sheer force. Taking a deep breath to steady myself, I aimed at the creature's skull-adorned head. With the first shot, the creature recoiled but did not retreat. The second shot struck one of its massive antlers, breaking it off. To my horror, a thick black liquid oozed from the severed appendage, and its determination only seemed to mount. As it charged me once more, I knew that this was my final chance. The weight of my survival hinged on me nailing this third shot I had to hit it in a vital area. As time seemed to slow down, I poised the rifle and aimed for what I believed to be the creature's heart. The gunshot echoed through the woods. In those agonizing seconds after I fired, I was certain I'd surely missed my mark. However, the creature's momentum became its downfall as it collapsed mere inches from reaching me. My adrenaline levels were still high as I processed what happened, how this monstrosity could possess such strength and ferocity, 
and what twisted birth had spawned it into existence would remain unanswered for now. I cautiously made my way back out of the forest and towards civilization. No one would believe my encounter with this monstrous beast even if I tried to spin a half-hearted tale. The horrifying events that unfolded would forever haunt me through restless nights and jolts of fear at every shadowy shape that crossed my path. Gazing at the stars in disbelief, only one thing was clear in that moment. No matter how well my friends tried to comfort me in days to come or how many times they insisted we search for answers together, I could never return to those woods again, lest fate seal its deadly deal. I found myself hiking through the dense forest of the Klamath Mountains in Northern California, enjoying the solitude and beauty it offered. The sun was setting, casting a golden glow through the trees. I remember chuckling to myself at how glad I was that today was just a regular day. My name is Alden Burkhart, a 35-year-old outdoor enthusiast who often seeks solace in nature. As I continued through the woods, Contemplating life and appreciating the wonders around me, I suddenly stumbled upon an unusual, yet oddly captivating, sight. There, in a small clearing, was a scene straight out of a horror movie several mutilated animal carcasses laid before me. The air held an uneasy stillness that lingered on my skin like an icy breath. Instead of feeling fear or disgust, though, Curiosity got the best of me as I thought about what could do such a thing. As I surveyed the grotesque display before me, I accidentally stepped on a dry twig which snapped beneath my boot. All hope that remained for quiet exploration vanished instantly. In response, there came an unsettling clatter from deep within the forest. That's when it emerged, its deceptively lanky frame shrouded by darkness as it moved towards me with ominous intent. Its head resembled that of a deer skull adorned with razor-sharp antlers. Elongated limbs supporting its hulking torso suggested something unnatural from the depths of nightmares. So, this is how I meet my end. I murmured under my breath. I guess there's no help for cardiophobes. Instead of fleeing in panic, though, Something within compelled me to stand my ground after all. There wasn't really anyone else who could help out in these remote woods. Hey, buddy! Is Halloween early this year? I taunted nervously, hoping some humor would ease my terrified heart. But as we know, villains don't often find humor amusing. Seemingly unfazed by the retort, it continued to move in my direction with deliberate steps. What was I going to run anyway? I decided it was time to take some action. I grabbed the hunting knife from my belt and eyed the creature with as much confidence as I could muster. The way it swayed toward me felt like a surreal dance in slow motion as it came ever closer, like an eerie puppet master controlling the strings of fate. Or was I witnessing evolution's attempt at mimicking the human form? Whatever this thing was... Its movements were far from natural, and every fundamental instinct screamed for me to stay away. But maybe that was how it hunted by stalking and intimidating until prey had no choice but to capitulate. Growing tired of the predator-prey dance, I decided to take charge with a well-practiced swipe of my blade, aimed at one of its thick limbs. A burst of red punctuated the air accompanied by a guttural growl that told me I'd angered it further. Feeling both exhilarated and frightened from this unlikely feat in face of danger, I borrowed a joke from a classic horror film to lighten my nerves. How do you make a werewolf stew? I paused for dramatic effect, yet fully aware it wasn't about to laugh. Keep him waiting! As I stared at the creature before me, I realized that calling for help would not hold much advantage. It wouldn't arrive in time and my phone had no signal in this remote part of the woods. It was now or never. Ignoring the pain in my leg from the previous swipe, I aimed my next attack at its other limbs, 
hoping to weaken it even further. It again growled with discomfort, but it didn't back down. It lunged towards me with surprising agility. Instinctively, I tried to dodge, but its sharp antlers caught on the fabric of my shirt, pinning me against a tree. The creature's skull-like face neared mine uncomfortably close, and its foul breath invaded my nostrils. With my free hand holding the knife, I slashed at its limb that held me captive against the tree. The creature hissed as its grip loosened and I dropped down to the ground. Not wanting to give it another chance, I hobbled away as quickly as my injured leg allowed. The distance between us grew wider with each step I took. My desperation for survival pushed me to run harder and faster than ever before. Somehow, I spotted a hunter's cabin up ahead and realized that there may be a potential weapon inside or at least a place to hide from this nightmare. The intensity of its growls alarmed me from behind. There was no doubt that it still pursued relentlessly, but something else caught my attention as well several gunshots echoed in the air. Staggering into the cabin's yard, I saw a pair of hunters armed with rifles. They appeared just as terrified yet resolved to bring down the creature that pursued me. The creature hesitated for a moment upon seeing them but ultimately continued its assault, clearly undeterred by their firearms. With fear etched onto their faces, they fired round after round at their attacker. Despite sustaining multiple gunshots, the creature still fought back wildly with its remaining limbs. Eventually, the hunters managed to land a final shot directly at its skull, and it collapsed to the ground. Panting heavily, they looked at each other in disbelief as their unusual prey lay motionless among the leaves. Are you okay? One hunter asked me, taking notice of my wounded leg. Yeah, I'll manage, I replied, trying to steady myself. They helped me inside the cabin and treated my leg. We left the creature's corpse in the woods. None of us wanted any part of it. As days went by and life started returning to normalcy, my injuries began to heal. The hunters decided not to speak about this event, fearing that people might consider them delusional. I agreed not to describe our ordeal as well because there was no rational explanation for what had happened but the memory of that chilling encounter would be forever engraved in our minds. It served as a gruesome reminder that sometimes nature presented us with horrors beyond our wildest imagination, a lesson we unwillingly learned during our face-off with an unfathomable predator in its habitat. I remember that fateful trip like it was yesterday. I had decided to visit Peterson's Bluff in the U.S., the spot of my childhood memories. The sun was setting after a long day of hiking, and I grew more nostalgic with each step. I'd been cracking jokes all day to ease my nerves, saying things like, Who put this river here? As a kid, I could have sworn it was five minutes away. My laughter echoed through the forest. Having brought a shotgun for protection, I walked confidently towards my destination, a small abandoned mining town hidden amongst the forest. My name is Harlan Brooks, and I'm not someone who gets scared easily, but there was something unsettling about the journey that lie ahead. As dusk arrived, night descended quickly upon me and the forest's ethereal stillness sent shivers down my spine. The darkness encroached upon me like an otherworldly menace, forcing me to question every shadow along the path. I soon stumbled upon an old friend from our childhood days spent exploring this eerie woodland. Bexley Thorne and his sister Leora were huddling together nervously near an abandoned cabin. They were affable as always, but their happy reunion turned somber, as they described violent activity in the area stories of mutilated animals and unexplained deaths sent my heart racing. The shadows grew darker when we heard faint whispers echoing among the trees. Against our better judgment, 
We continued along the path grasping our weapons tightly as an unnerving sense of dread consumed us. It was Bexley who spotted it first he queried aloud if that shadow had been there just moments ago. I could barely make out its silhouette, tall, lanky frame with elongated limbs branching out in twisted angles. It was difficult to be specific on details because its head looked like a deer or stag skull with sharp antlers arrayed horrifically. It exuded menace, its body contorted and unnatural. Panic overran us, and we dashed back to the cabin, boarded the doors, and called for help. Our phones refused to cooperate as the signal was weak in this remote area. The feeling that something sinister was watching intensified as whispers turned into blood-curdling growls. With guns reloaded and knives sharpened, we looked out through gaps in the boarded windows. Leora spotted it first the creature was circling the cabin, studying us like prey. It was then she asked the question hanging in all our minds. Harlan, do you think it's smart enough to unlock doors? They should really consider upgrading to digital security around here. I joked nervously trying to lighten the dreadful mood. As night progressed, so did our desperation. Our calls for help were still met with resounding silence. Leora's gentle teardrops imprinted themselves in our minds, her fear accentuating names of missing neighbors that resonated deeply within us. As stories turned into evidence before our eyes, I revealed my own gruesome discovery from earlier in the day a mutilated deer bearing a macabre signature, carved runes that chilled us to the bone. We took turns maintaining watch through gaps in our barricade. The creature appeared more horrific as night extended its reign. Shadows danced over its deer-like skull that seemed almost sentient as sunlight smudged against its antlered silhouette. Bexley gasped when he saw what I assumed was the beast again after some time had passed, but this time, it was not alone. Hunched creatures copped along in grotesque unison behind it lured by some dark abyssal purpose. Leora sobbed pitifully as they swarmed locked doors and whispered unintelligible horrors outside windows we dared not open. We knew they were waiting for just one opportunity to attack and that it was only a matter of time before they found it. Bexley asked, What do we do? I took a deep breath and tried to think logically. We can't stay here forever, I said. We have to make a plan and get help. Leora continued sobbing, her face buried in her hands. Bexley frantically looked around the room as if searching for an idea. Okay, okay, I'll try to make a run for it, he said with determination. There's a police station not far from here. If I can get there, we'll have help soon. Leora's face emerged from her hands. No, Bexley, you can't. They'll catch you. He placed his hands on her shoulders, giving her a steady look. It's our only chance. Turning to me, he asked. Can you watch over Liara while I'm gone? Mustering courage, I nodded. Just be careful out there. With one last determined glance at both of us, Bexley slipped out the door and began his desperate sprint towards the police station. Silence hung around us as Liora and I kept our vigil at the barricade. We heard faint noises outside, unintelligible whispers and sickening laughter, but the creatures didn't try to force their way in. Two agonizing hours later, we heard a knock on the door and voices shouting, Police! Open up! Relief washed over me as we opened the door to find two officers accompanied by Bexley. Thank God you made it, Leora whispered as she embraced Bexley. The officers wasted no time in taking control of the situation. They listened as we recounted what had happened, their faces growing graver with each word. As they began preparations for facing these unknown assailants, they focused on strategy. We'll help you all board up your windows and doors to keep them out. An officer explained. We have called for reinforcements, but it could take some time for them to arrive. We'll do our best to protect you all in the meantime. 
Over the next few hours, our once quiet neighborhood transformed into a makeshift fortress. Armed officers patrolled the streets as terrified residents peered through makeshift barricades, waiting for any gruesome attack from these bizarre creatures. Despite our precautions, we weren't entirely safe. One early morning, an officer spotted a group of creatures attempting to enter a nearby home but was unable to save its occupants. Tension and fear only grew as news of the gruesome scene spread. The horrifying siege continued until backup finally arrived, bringing with them expertise and equipment more suited for these relentless, monstrous attackers. Sleep-deprived and shaken, we were ushered out of our homes and loaded into waiting vehicles that would take us to a secure location. As we drove away from our neighborhood-turned-battlefield, I couldn't stop thinking about the mutilated deer and those chilling carved runes. Somewhere deep down, I knew this was just the beginning of something far more sinister. But for now, all I wanted was shelter from those nightmarish visions. Our small community never truly felt safe again. Over time, people moved away, while others struggled to come to terms with those horrific days when those grotesque creatures terrorized us. For many years following the incident, I refused to venture out beyond the safety of my home after dark. I would helplessly remember Bexley's bravery and Leora's immense fear and grief when she lost her beloved neighbors. The scars left by these gruesome events still remain. It's an eerie trace of something no one could ever fully comprehend or forget. I had just parked my car at the entrance of Edward Forest, excited because I had finally been able to get some days off to go hiking all by myself. My name is Aster Curie, and I find that there is no better way to unwind than exploring the great outdoors. While locking my car, I caught a glimpse of another hiker preparing his backpack and adjusting his straps as if he was about to challenge me into a race. Hey! he called out. One would think you're the type who'd drink a full cup of coffee and not even offer any to other people on their way up. We both laughed before properly introducing ourselves. While deep in conversation with the other hiker named Thane Rousseau, we started venturing into Edward Forest. Admiring the landscape around us and taking in its beauty, we quickly lost track of time. The trees towered high above us, blocking most of the sunlight that attempted to filter through the branches. Insects buzzed around us as birds sang their melodious tunes from hidden perches. As Thane and I trekked further along the trail, we noticed deep claw marks etched into multiple trees surrounding us. Before we could give much thought to the strange markings, we found ourselves near an old abandoned cabin tucked away in a small clearing. Curiosity peaked we decided to take a closer look. Outside the cabin's entrance lay a knot upon carcass with entrails spread out that neither Thane nor I could easily identify. It didn't look like anything done by animals native to this area. Hesitantly entering the cabin, we carefully tiptoed around broken glass and rotting wood planks that seemed ready to collapse at any second. Unsurprisingly, inside the cabin covered with dust and cobwebs, lay remnants of solemn life once lived in these woods. As we went deeper, Thane leaned forward to examine a yellowing piece of paper nailed to the wall. We weren't sure what it was referring to, but we felt an uneasy atmosphere for sure. As the day went on, Thane and I decided to camp out for the night near a small stream not too far from the cabin. We joked around, trying to lighten the eerie air we now found ourselves in. After roasting marshmallows over a crackling fire and sharing our favorite funny stories, we climbed into our tents as darkness consumed our surroundings. In the middle of the night, we heard rustling in the distance. Slowly waking up and peeking out of our tents, we saw an unfamiliar silhouette creeping through the dense forest towards us. It was much taller than any human or animal we had ever come across 
with elongated limbs and a skeletal build. As it moved closer, we realized its head resembled that of a deer's skull with sharp antlers sprouting from each side. This was no animal either of us had ever encountered before, but I remembered seeing something similar in a journal found inside the cabin, warning residents and visitors of something stalking through the woods. Gripped by fear but unwilling to sit there waiting for it to get nearer, Thane whispered urgently that we should flee as silently as possible. Neither one of us dared call for help because just one misstep might be enough for this otherworldly creature to catch us unawares. Stealthily, we packed our belongings and attempted to slip away from our campsite, but the sound of snapping twigs beneath our feet alerted whatever stalked us from a distance. Its pace quickened as its unearthly eyes locked onto ours, pursuing us relentlessly through Edward Forrest's treacherous terrain. We picked up the pace too with no time for hesitation or carelessness, purely focused on escaping from this nightmare that materialized out of nowhere. Thane shouted, I always get the last laugh on something funny, but today's leg day joke didn't exactly hit as I hoped. A remark that felt strangely reassuring, even in our dire situation. Our hearts raced as we continued running through the forest. We could hear it getting closer to us, its raspy breaths and heavy steps sending shivers down our spines. Each moment grew more intense as we tried to flee, making every effort not to trip or stumble. Inching our way through the underbrush, we knew that calling for help would only attract more attention to ourselves. The creature seemed to have a keen sense of hearing, and any noise could be the trigger that seals our fate. Instead, we relied on hand signals and occasional whispers, hoping to maintain enough distance between us and the creature. The forest was vast, but we knew there was a road on the other side if we could just reach it. That road represented our last chance to find help and maybe even survive this ordeal. We kept pushing through the thick foliage, every step feeling like it could be our last. At one point, we spotted a hiker in the distance. We wanted to call out to him, but the thought of attracting the creature's attention made us hesitate. Eventually, we decided against it and watched him disappear into the woods. Besides, involving another innocent person in our brutal predicament felt wrong. As we continued on, Thane suggested breaking off tree branches and dropping them behind us in case someone found our campsite and decided to follow us. It was a desperate effort to leave some kind of trail without making too much noise. Suddenly, I felt a sharp pain in my leg as I tripped over a hidden tree root, instinctively letting out a gasp of pain. Panic set in as we heard the creature's footsteps rapidly closing in on us. Thane grabbed my arm and helped me up. There was no time for rest or apologies now. We sprinted as fast as our weary legs could carry us. We finally reached an opening in the woods where we saw the road in sight, just mere feet away from us. However, our momentary relief vanished when I heard Thane's desperate cry. He had stumbled and fallen behind me. Turning around to help my friend, I watched in horror as the creature reached out with its elongated limbs towards Thane. It was now or never. I couldn't leave him behind, but I also knew we couldn't fight this creature off. Run! Thane screamed, his voice filled with terror as the creature grabbed him. Seeing no other choice, I sprinted towards the road my heart sinking as Thane's screams echoed in my ears. Reaching the road, I stumbled upon a passing car and desperately flagged it down. The driver was taken aback by my disheveled appearance but agreed to help and called the police. When they arrived at the scene, all that remained were Thane's tattered clothes and blood splatters on the forest floor. The mysterious creature had vanished without a trace. While I recounted our nightmarish ordeal to the authorities, I could only think of Thane, my friend who had sacrificed himself so that I might escape. In the weeks and months that followed, search parties turned up nothing, 
leaving more questions than answers. Eventually, the case went cold, a horrifying mystery forever etched in Edward Forrest's history. People speak of cautionary tales about venturing too deep into those woods now. Still, to me, it serves as a chilling reminder of the friend who bravely faced an unknown horror so that I could escape its grasp. Haunted by the memory of Thane's screams, and knowing what became of him will weigh heavily on me for the rest of my life. Perhaps some creatures are best left undiscovered and forgotten in the hidden corners of our world. It was around evening when I stepped out of my old Ford truck and gazed upon the abandoned, sprawling grounds of the former Hohenwald Zoo. My name's Baxter Archibald. A dear friend of mine had called me on the radio about a strange creature roaming nearby and requested my assistance. This wasn't unusual for me, being an experienced hunter with an interest in ominous unknown creatures. I couldn't resist taking a look. The decrepit buildings and neglected vegetation loomed over me like dormant monsters ready to awaken at any moment. There was something captivating about this place, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Following my keen instincts, I ventured into the zoo's main gate, cautiously exploring what remained of its concrete paths and former glory. The air quickly became colder sharp wind whipping across my face as I heard distant branches rustling. My every muscle tensed as I approached a crumbling lion exhibit and discovered several mutilated animal carcasses scattered across the floor. It looked like something straight out of a horror movie. Blood pulled around them in grotesque patterns that you'd think would be laughable if not actually happening before your eyes. A voice startled me from behind a fellow hunter named Jonas Brintworth who decided to tag along after hearing the news of my venture through our community chatter. He had arrived just in time to witness this macabre scene and help me track down whatever caused it. So, Jonas whispered nervously, do you think this was done by that creature they were talking about? Shrugging, I couldn't say for sure. You know as much as I do right now. But whatever did this couldn't have been normal. Our trepidation increased as tooth-shaped marks carved into wall depressions caught our attention. Something massive with massive antlers had torn its way through this enclosure. We followed the trail only to stumble upon even more carnage. A strong stench of decay forced us to cover our noses as our eyes settled on the mangled remains of other deceased animals, mauled and strewn about their enclosures. The sun was setting now, and we realized we had been so invested in investigation that we'd forgotten to seek help from local authorities. Neither of us had cell reception in this remote corner of the United States, and with each passing moment, I could see Jonas growing anxious. He cracked a joke to lighten the mood. What do you think, Baxter? Could it be Bigfoot going on a jungle diet? I chuckled dryly. Seems unlikely. Whatever this thing is, it's not something I'd laugh about. Gripping our firearms tightly, we pressed on as the zoo seemed to grow exponentially darker with each passing step. My night vision goggles picked up something odd near the giraffe exhibit. A tall, lanky figure paced back and forth behind what remained of a damaged fence. Its elongated limbs ended in razor-sharp claws that grazed the ground with ease. As we crept closer, terror struck my core, holding me captive. The creature turned its deer skull like head in our direction, deep-set eyes glowing unnaturally from the darkness of its hollow sockets while its twisted antlers scraped against overgrown trees. Its guttural snarl revealed abnormally large fangs a contradicting reflection of its herbivore appearance. Cold sweat drenched me as Jonas whispered urgently, Baxter, let's call for help now. Find some higher ground before it sees us. But there was no time left. With immense speed and agility for such an otherworldly beast, it leaped over the metallic fence and swiftly charged towards us. 
Jonas managed to fire off several shots before diving into nearby brush. But the creature didn't seem phased at all. It just kept coming. Without thinking twice, I heaved a cry out for anyone nearby. Help! We're being attacked! Around us, the remaining zoo employees scrambled from their duties, seeking safety or perhaps to help us. The beast continued its mad dash towards me and Jonas, unrelenting in its nightmarish pursuit. It was too late. There was no outrunning the creature at this point. Remembering our firearms, I took a deep breath and aimed for its legs. If we could at least slow it down, maybe we could buy enough time for reinforcements to arrive. Jonas fired off shots as well, his hands shaking, but his accuracy on point. Eventually, our efforts seemed to take an effect, with the creature faltering slightly but continuing its advance. A voice called out nearby. Baxter! Jonas! Hang on! We're coming! I recognized it as Chris, one of the security guards at the zoo and a close friend of mine. He was sprinting towards us with Janine, the lead zookeeper. Both wielded tranquilizer guns in hand. Cornered near the fence with nowhere left to go, I turned back and saw the creature stalk ever closer with cruel determination in those hollow eyes. Chris took position next to me and shouted a warning at the beast before firing tranquilizer darts at it with astounding precision. Janine's darts quickly followed suit. One after another they struck the creature's neck and chest. The beast let out a gut-wrenching howl of pain as it stumbled backwards before ultimately crashing to the ground. The earth trembled beneath it while it breathed heavily. Janine cautiously approached it soon after, assessing its response to the tranquilizers. She turned back to us and confirmed what seemed obvious now that we had some time to process what had just transpired. We had subdued the creature. Chris panted heavily beside me before reassuringly patting me on the back. You guys all right? I nodded, catching my breath from the ordeal. Thanks for coming so quickly. What do we do with this thing now? We need to report this to the authorities immediately, Janine said, taking charge and doing her best to maintain composure given the chaotic events. We'll contain the creature until they arrive. They'll determine if it's a new species that must be further studied. For hours, we detailed our accounts to police officers and animal control personnel who arrived on scene, carefully examining the creature and transporting it away from the zoo. The employees working at the zoo that day would forever remember the gruesome attack and just how dangerously close we had come to a much more tragic outcome. In the end... It was decided to keep word of the undiscovered creature to a minimum to prevent widespread panic amongst those who frequented the zoo regularly. As days turned into weeks after that harrowing ordeal, things began to fall back into place, but we knew nothing would ever be quite the same again. I squeezed Jonah's shoulder as we returned to our regular duties at the zoo. We were the lucky ones— surviving a brush with a nightmarish entity even though our minds couldn't comprehend it. A chill went down my spine as I imagined what could have happened if Jonas hadn't fired those life-saving shots or Chris and Janine hadn't arrived in time. No one could explain what kind of creature it was or why it ended up in our zoo, but one thing was certain, nothing would ever be taken for granted again. And while my life went on, I couldn't help but find myself constantly looking over my shoulder during those closing shifts at work, always prepared for another unexpected visit from an unseen danger lurking in the distance. I was sitting at my favorite diner, sipping a cup of coffee when I overheard the conversation taking place in the booth behind me. Did you hear about those strange disappearances near the Swift River in New Hampshire? said one man. Yeah, replied his companion with a chuckle. You mean Jasper's so-called monster? 
They both laughed and continued the banter. It caught my attention, and I couldn't help but eavesdrop. My name is Jameson Quincy, an avid outdoorsman and lover of all things mysterious. The next morning, after doing some research and packing my gear, I found myself driving to the remote location where these strange events were supposedly happening. Arriving at the campground, I set up camp for the following night and proceeded to ask around about this mysterious creature people spoke of. The consensus was that the tall, lanky figure had elongated limbs, appearing almost skeletal in nature. Its head resembled a deer or stag skull with sharp antlers, an unsettling sight for sure. Why don't these people just call for help? I thought to myself. Then it dawned on me that in this isolated part of New Hampshire, cell reception was practically non-existent. It seemed likely that those who ventured out here wanted to escape from the world and its problems, not broadcast them. As I hiked along the picturesque trails that wound through the dense forest beside the swift river, I couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched. The hair on my neck stood up as the words of warning from various campers echoed in my mind. Watch out for Jasper's nightmare. At dusk, as I started a crackling fire at my campsite, a fellow camper named Laura Branwell approached me hesitantly. Hey there, she said with a nervous smile. You must be Jameson. People talked about you today. Be on your guard, all right? I smiled and responded. Sure thing, Laura. You know, sometimes I wonder what a bear would say if he could talk. Am I a villain in someone else's story? She chuckled and then walked back to her camp. Later that night, unable to sleep and with the nagging feeling of being watched still lingering, I ventured out along the trails with my flashlight and handgun. Half-jokingly, I considered it was time to meet this nightmare creature head-on. My steps became more cautious as the trail grew narrower, surrounded by thick foliage. Suddenly, I heard a faint rustling behind me. Whirling around, I saw in horror the skeletal creature from their descriptions— tall and lanky with elongated limbs adorned with sharp antlers upon its deer-like skull. It lunged towards me with unnatural speed. In response, I fired multiple shots at the creature but they seemed to have no effect as it advanced closer. It stared at me with its hollow eye sockets before suddenly disappearing into the shadows without caution, but not before scratching my arm deeply. Dazed and bleeding from my wounds, I stumbled back into camp. Laura immediately saw that something was wrong and rushed over to help me apply pressure on the gash and tend to my injury. As she worked on my arm, other campers gathered around us whispering about this frightening brush with Jasper's nightmare. I knew that leaving wasn't an option. Something had to be done about this deadly creature stalking the remote woods near the swift river. Desperately cautioning each other never to leave our sight alone until daylight, we began planning ways to find answers about its origin and intent, not just for our own safety but for those who might venture here unaware of the gruesome threat lurking amidst the beauty surrounding them. As night turned into day and each passing moment filled us with dread, Laura and I encouraged one another by sharing amusing stories and thoughts, despite our precarious situation. It was here that I discovered a new friendship amidst a dark cloud of fear and uncertainty. Realization set in as we reviewed our plan to confront the monster once more. We would never truly had the chance to understand its motives or origins. Without answers, we wouldn't be able to help future campers from falling prey to its monstrous grasp. More determined than ever to put an end to this madness, we set off back into the trails. As Laura and I ventured deeper into the woods, the fear of another attack by the unknown creature grew stronger. Yet we were determined to find a way to stop this threat. We continued our journey through the densely wooded area near the swift river, with only one goal, to put an end to the nightmare that haunted us and other campers in these once peaceful lands. The campers we left behind remained on edge 
constantly listening for any signs of danger lurking nearby. Some brave souls even joined forces to patrol the campsite perimeter, keeping watch for any unwelcome intruders. Unfortunately, no matter how hard they tried to stay safe, there was no guarantee the sinister being wouldn't strike again. With each step, Laura and I grew more tired and wary. Our heads throbbed from fatigue and tension, but we pushed forward. We knew we needed to find some clue or evidence about the creature to solve this deadly mystery. When daylight finally broke, our weary bodies had carried us quite a distance from camp, much deeper into the wilderness than either of us had ever ventured before. Despite our heavy limbs and a lingering sense of dread hanging over us like a thick fog, we trudged onward. Then suddenly, without warning or provocation, Jasper's nightmare was upon us once again. It emerged from between two trees with its elongated limbs reaching out toward us menacingly. Its skull-like deer or stag head towered over us with sharp antlers ready to sink into our flesh at any moment. Paralyzed by fear yet knowing our best chance of survival was to stay together and fight back somehow, even if that meant running or calling for help, we hesitated long enough for the creature to strike Laura first. A blood-curdling scream escaped her lips as its sharp claws ripped through her fragile body with such force that she was thrown into nearby bushes. My voice cracked as I vainly yelled for help knowing all too well that our cries would likely not be heard by anyone in the far-off campsite. I watched in horror as the creature approached Laura's motionless form and began dragging her deeper into the forest. Mustering what little strength and courage I had left, I picked up a large rock and hurled it at the creature. The rock hit it squarely on its skull-like head, causing it to relinquish its grasp on Laura momentarily. Sensing an opportunity to escape, I rushed forward to grab Laura's hand and together we stumbled away from the creature, never looking back. Our terrified run through the woods seemed everlasting, each breath felt like needles piercing our lungs. Eventually, we stumbled upon a hunting cabin hidden within the thick trees. As we scrambled inside seeking temporary refuge— we barricaded ourselves against any possible entry by the creature. Without any other options left, we decided to send an emergency signal from the cabin's radio. Static crackled before giving way to a faint voice on the other end, telling us that help was on its way. It was a small victory in our desperate situation. Hours later, we were finally rescued by a group of local hunters who had received our distress signal. They took us back to camp where we could receive medical attention and reunite with the others, each person visually shaken by their own personal encounters with this mysterious menace. As traumatic as our ordeal had been, both Laura and I knew that we could never truly understand what drove Jasper's nightmare to terrorize us so relentlessly. Despite countless sightings and inexplicable encounters over those harrowing few days, there were no answers surrounding its origins or motives. In the end, though we had narrowly escaped death, the somber screams and desperate cries of fellow campers would forever be etched into our memories as a chilling reminder of our close encounter with the monstrous creature that haunted us all. With heavy hearts, we left behind the woods knowing this area would now forever be plagued by darkness. Although Jasper's nightmare had eluded us, the remnants of our brushes with death and the emotional scars left behind would serve as lasting testament to the horrors that we endured. I was driving down an isolated road, somewhere in Wyoming, trying to get a break from work. I jokingly said to myself, I guess this beats being stuck behind a desk, huh? Marvelous mountains and vast valleys stretched out on both sides of the road. I'd been driving for hours, and the sun was setting behind the peaks in a spectacular display of colors. As night fell, I flicked on my car's headlights. There was something ominous about these rocky roads after sundown. 
Just as I passed the sign announcing that I was now in the Bridger Teton National Forest, a sudden downpour started to hammer against the windshield. I checked the map on my phone and realized that there were barely any towns or settlements around. My name is Talbert Hoskins, and if you've ever heard stories about getting lost in the woods in remote regions of America, you know that this wasn't exactly a good place to be. Figuring that it was better to be safe than sorry, I decided to pull over into a small rest stop for shelter from the storm. The rain was unforgiving and brutal, leaving me no choice but to spend the night in my car. It seemed like nature had other plans for me when I heard a faint distress call coming from the forest's edge. At this point, one's first instinct would be to stay put or call for help. But with no phone signal nor any soul around for miles, my compassionate nature took over. Fighting off fear and worry, laced with occasional humor of what awaited me at home, I grabbed my flashlight and mustered up courage as I ventured into the shroud of darkness under twisted branches from towering trees which seemed alive, ready to lunge at any moment. On my way through this damp, wild world, I stumbled across a gruesome sight in the form of what looked like mutilated animal remains. It was as if something snacked on it and left the leftovers scattered around. I noticed some prints in the wet soil. Deer? Elk? They were large and didn't quite seem right. With growing unease, I followed the faint cries deeper into the woods, parting curtains of foliage into a clearing. Huddled against a tree, I found a woman, bruised and shivering. My name's Talbert Hoskins, I told her gently, urging her to come with me. During our trek back to the car, she hesitantly shared her experience about running into that twisted creature, which nobody knew with certainty what it was, and detailed its appearance. She spoke of its tall, lanky frame with elongated limbs, and how its head looked like a deer or stag skull with sharp antlers. As we approached the car, I heard branches snap somewhere behind us. Now alert, I prepared myself mentally for an unexpected showdown. Pulling out my gun from the back seat, I reassured the injured woman that we would be safe. Suddenly, like a manifestation of pure dread, it appeared in our erratic flashlight beam, that grotesque, Endler Bing stood not far from where we now huddled inside my car. Without time to pause for disbelief or ponder its origin, I aimed at it but never got a shot off as its menacing gaze bore down upon us with terrifying authority. We watched as this unspeakable terror continued to stalk around our makeshift sanctuary, each movement seemingly deliberate and calculated to find weak points or even provoke a fleeing response from either of us in that confined space. Time seemed to hang suspended in an endless loop. We eventually lost sight of our pursuer. This was not relief in itself. No triumph came easy facing that faceless abomination, but rather a leap into unknown territory where caution had to be constantly negotiated against palpable fear coursing through every nerve fiber. Amidst it all, I whispered reassuring words to the traumatized woman while remaining laser-focused on our ever-narrowing options. Ever more desperate for help, I picked up my phone and tried dialing for assistance. My fingers trembled as I punched in the numbers, heart pounding in my ears as though it would burst out of my chest any moment. But I was met with a busy signal. I cursed at our unbelievably bad fortune— we were alone in facing this depraved creature. The injured woman whispered that we should find a way to lock the car doors. Without hesitation, we locked every door and closed every window tight, hoping that the beast wouldn't be able to breach our weak defenses. We held our breaths in anticipation of its next move. Eyes darting back and forth between each window, I tried to spot the creature lurking nearby. Everything looked eerily still outside, but there was no sign of it having retreated into the darkness either. The quiet moments that followed were nerve-wracking, a haphazard tension punctuated only by the occasional grunt or rustle from within the car. Suddenly, 
A deafening screech of metal against metal rent the air as sharp and the like claws tore through one of the car doors, mere inches from where the injured woman sat. Reflexively, she screamed at the terrifying attack, her eyes shut tight against impending doom. I jerked at both steering wheel and ignition key, praying that we'd somehow manage to leave this nightmare behind with each turn of the tires. The engine roared to life and with tires squealing, we lurched forward away from our attacker. Risking a glimpse behind us revealed an image of horror. The creature had torn open an entire side of my car with its razor-sharp antlers but still stood rooted to its spot. Its wicked expression seemed to suggest it had derived some sick pleasure from inflicting pain and fear upon us. Unanswered questions about its origin not further inside me, but now was not the time for curiosity. T thank you, whispered the injured woman, her voice trembling. You saved my life. It took every ounce of self-control to keep my hands steady on the wheel and not falter in our escape. We're not out of this yet, I muttered, focusing on the road ahead. We pushed forward into the night, unsure of where to go, but unwilling to stay another moment in that forsaken place. The small town nearby offered some semblance of safety. Perhaps there someone would believe our bizarre encounter and be able to do something. With rescue still out of reach thanks to patchy phone signals, we clung to frayed hope tightly as we could. Reaching the town, we sought refuge in a makeshift first aid center run by local volunteers. There, the injured woman received much-needed medical attention and began recovering from her ordeal. We recounted our harrowing experience to incredulous ears and watched their faces become ashen with dread. Days went by as we tried to piece together some semblance of normalcy amidst shaken nerves and heightened senses. Gratitude abounded from townspeople and victim alike for my part in fleeing that horror. But I couldn't shake the suspicion that despite our momentary escape, that creature might still be out there, waiting for its next prey while lurking just beyond human sight. In time, some townsfolk came forward with new information. A man who had witnessed similar horrific creatures in the past but chose silence over ridicule. Shared experiences gradually built a solidarity stronger than fear, and although no answers ever surfaced for the creature's existence or origin, its victims found solace knowing they were not alone. As weeks turned into months and then drifted slowly through years, the once unthinkable encounter with that antlered beast began fading into whispers of lore amongst those who had been affected directly or indirectly by its gruesome attacks. Tales of survival earned weight among locals, steadfastly refusing to fade into obscurity like some mere campfire story. That night's events shall remain forever etched in mind and memory, for it was then I glimpsed a terror more sinister than any figment of the human imagination. It was then I sensed the eerie potential that lay within those shadowed spaces betwixt life and death, where unnameable, unspeakable things fester, waiting for the right moment to strike. It all started when Frank Kilmer invited me to his secluded cabin in the woods of Big Bear, California. I found something you just have to see, he said, and that was all it took to pique my curiosity. So, there I was, guiding my rental car along the winding mountain roads. Frank Kilmer, I muttered to myself. It had been years since we last spoke, and I was curious about what he found so important that it warranted an impromptu trip. When I arrived, Frank immediately led me to a concealed cave near his cabin. As we reached it, I felt a chill run down my spine even though the sun bore down heavily upon us both. You'll never guess what I unearthed here, Frank said, a sparkle in his eyes. His excitement was contagious as we crouched to enter the cave's narrow entrance. Inside, after turning on our flashlights, I stared at the strange markings etched into the stone walls. 
they formed a rather bizarre pattern which appeared to be ancient and possibly even tribal. So is this why you called me up here? I asked Frank. He grinned back at me. Nope. What I wanted you to see is this. He pointed toward an odd-looking metallic object half buried in the dirt. What is that? I asked as we both studied it closely. No idea. Frank replied nonchalantly as he carefully dug around it with his pocket knife. All of a sudden, we heard crunching footsteps approaching outside the cave. My heart raced as adrenaline kicked in. Who's there? shouted Frank, standing tall and defensive near the entrance. The footsteps halted for a moment, but then resumed coming closer. That was when we saw it an abomination of a creature with elongated limbs and bone-like antlers sprouting from its dear skull. It gazed at us with lifeless, hollow eyes and an unmistakable hunger. Good God, I whispered, grabbing a sizable rock as a makeshift weapon. Frank took a step back, positioning himself next to me. What do you think that is? Don't know, he replied, his voice shaking. But we must defend ourselves. The creature's unnervingly long limbs slowly moved it forward into the cave. Frantically, I racked my brain for some kind of battle strategy but struggled to come up with one as the seconds ticked down and the grotesque creature crept closer, filling the dim cavern with the stench of decay. Can we call for help? I asked just above a whisper. No signal out here, he replied with resignation. I prepared myself for the inevitable attack. Just as we readied our makeshift weapons, Frank glanced over at me and forced out a chuckle. I always wanted to ask, did you hear about the claustrophobic astronaut? He inquired, attempting to inject some humor into the dire situation. No, I replied with a weak smile, my hands gripping onto the sharp-edged rock even tighter. He just needed a little more space. Frank muttered. His attempt at levity was certainly appreciated, but our focus quickly returned to the incoming threat. The monstrous creature advanced further into the cave, saliva dripping from its exposed jawbone. We mirrored its movements, slowly circling around it while keeping our distance. Its hunting tactics were unsettlingly smart, but its apparent intelligence made it all the more terrifying. As the creature closed in on us, Frank and I continued to circle it. It didn't seem to have a weak spot, at least not one that we could identify. My heart pounded in my chest, and my sweaty palms made it difficult to keep a firm grip on the rock. Frank! The ceiling! I shouted, pointing to the loose rocks above the creature. He gave me a nod of understanding. We both hurled our makeshift weapons at the weak-looking section of the rocky ceiling above the creature, hoping to weaken it enough to trigger a minor cave-in. Some of the debris struck the creature, and its elongated limbs flailed, trying to regain balance. But it wasn't enough. Instead of collapsing, more rocks merely dislodged from the ceiling and landed around it. Our failed attempt only seemed to anger the creature more. It lunged at Frank with its terrifying jawbone and sharp handlers, catching him off guard. The impact threw him against the cave wall with a sickening crunch. Frank! I screamed in horror as he fell limp at my feet. The creature let out a guttural sound in satisfaction before turning its attention back towards me. Desperate and cornered, I ran deeper into the cave hoping that maybe something would present itself as salvation. As luck would have it, or perhaps out of sheer desperation, I spotted narrow cracks in a section of the cave wall ahead. I squeezed myself into one of them, praying that a human wouldn't fit. The creature snarled upon seeing me slip into hiding and lunged toward me once more. Surprisingly, in its haste and determination to reach me, its powerful limbs collided head-on with the cave wall instead. There was a loud crash and an ear-splitting shriek from our pursuer. Stunned and injured from impact, it writhed in pain, 
limbs convulsing on the rocky ground. Now was my chance. With adrenaline coursing through me, I scrambled out of my hiding spot and sprinted toward the cave entrance. I knew that I couldn't defeat this monstrous creature single-handedly, but I hoped to make it back to town and rally others for help. As I stumbled out, gasping for breath, the creature's agonized scream echoed through the cave behind me. It may have lost its prey for now, but knowing such an abomination existed in our world filled me with dread. We needed to be prepared, for we faced something beyond our understanding. Finding the strength from deep within, I ran towards the town, tearing through branches and over rocky terrain. Had Frank not tried to lighten the mood earlier, he would still be alive. How many more lives would be lost? That horrific thought urged me to press on. The townspeople seemed shocked and frightened by my appearance and frantic explanations of what had happened in the cave. Nevertheless, they gathered themselves and headed out to rescue Frank if he was still alive or at least recover his body. Hours later, we stood somberly around Frank's grave as the last shovel of dirt fell onto his casket. It was a grim reminder that his wit and bravery had been snuffed out by something we had never seen before. How would we live knowing this terror haunted our land? No one knew what the next steps were or if there was any way to vanquish such malevolence. For now, we banded together and placed every bit of our hope in finding a way to protect ourselves from that sinister creature, to escape or ultimately stop it from hurting anyone else ever again. In memory of Frank's courageous spirit, we pressed forward into an uncertain future haunted by long limbs and exposed jawbones within dark caves, an image that would haunt us indefinitely. I remember the day clearly. There I was, sitting at the dingy bar in a small town. Me, Connor Hitchkins, drowning my sorrows and contemplating this unfortunate turn in my life when laughter erupted from a corner. A offbeat joke about elephants dancing in a tutu. It felt strange. Such frivolity in a place like this didn't sit well. Little did I know that my life was about to take an even darker path as I strode out into the remote forested region of Shasta Trinity National Forest in Northern California. Despite how tranquil it appeared on the surface, I had no clue what dangers lurked just beyond the shadows. As I wandered along the narrow trail, laden with dense foliage on both sides, two strangers emerged from behind me. Alan Weston and Rita Wexler introduced themselves and explained they were researching a mysterious creature often seen by hikers in the area. Intrigued by their story, we all decided to join forces and investigate further as a team. As our search took us deeper into the woods, far from civilization, we ventured farther away from our initial safety zone until ultimately losing track of time completely. The sky darkened rapidly above us before we knew it, night swiftly swallowing up any remnants of daylight left. Shadows seemed to extend unnaturally, coiling around us like willing partners in a macabre dance. In the midst of our growing unease, there came an eerie growl echoing through the trees something none of us had heard before sending icy shivers down our spines. Carefully scanning our surroundings didn't reveal any source for the sound. It seemed to evaporate into thin air just as quickly as it had permeated our quiet exploration. Rita whispered a joke to me under her breath. Why did the ghost go bar hopping? To get some booze. It wasn't very funny, but we laughed uneasily to cope with the growing fear. The little chuckle shattered the silence. Everything seemed off. Our nerves frazzled, we decided we should set up camp for the night. Huddled around a small fire, we set out our few belongings and prepared to settle down, hoping that rest would help to clear our minds. Before sleep could claim any of us, something happened that would sear itself into my memory forever. A creature entered our campsite, bathed in moonlight. 
A tall, lanky figure with elongated limbs stood at the edge of the clearing where we had set up our meager refuge. Its head resembled a deer or stag skull, complete with sharp antlers protruding defiantly from its crown. It stared unblinkingly at us with its hollow eyes, as if appraising our group for some sinister motive of its own. I remember thinking it was almost like looking at a grotesque fusion of man and beast, something unnatural and terrifying in equal measure. As we stared back at this horrifying entity in stunned silence, it began to circle around us slowly, each step causing a distinct crunch on the forest floor. Its movement seemed calculated and deliberate, like the stalk of a predator confidently closing in on its prey except for a subtle twitch or spasm occasionally disturbing its otherwise smooth motion. Transfixed by the sheer horror unfolding before me, I struggled to take my eyes off this haunting creature as it inspected our campsite. Suddenly, Alan took out his gun from his shoulder holster, his hands trembling intensely as he pointed the barrel in the direction of the approaching menace. Get away from us, he stammered his voice cracking under immense emotional strain. In response to Alan's threats, the creature emitted a guttural growl more menacing than anything we had ever heard before. It moved menacingly towards him hands extended as its long claws glinted wickedly in the faint light provided by our fire. The sight was so chilling it felt like ice was coursing through my veins as I watched, frozen in panic. Despite the terror gripping me, I managed to move closer to Alan, knowing that we had to stay together to survive. The rest of our group, Sarah and Jake, also huddled with us. We had ventured into the forest for a camping trip with no knowledge of the creature that now threatened our lives. The creature continued its approach, unfazed by Alan's gun. We started to back away, desperate to escape this nightmare. Sarah looked around desperately and noticed a fallen tree we could use it as an obstacle between us and the monster. Guys, let's go over there, she suggested as she pointed to the tree. We moved cautiously towards the tree while keeping our eyes on the creature. As we moved closer to our temporary sanctuary, I yanked my phone from my pocket in an attempt to call for help. But as I fumbled through my contacts... I found that there was no signal in this remote forest. All hope seemed lost. Once we reached the fallen tree, Jake and Alan helped Sarah over first before following suit. I struggled over it alone momentarily as Alan tried to steady his aim at the creature once more. The creature lunged at Alan just as he fired his gun. The shot missed the mark but it was enough to momentarily stun the beast as it flailed in confusion. It was during this commotion that I managed to climb over the fallen tree and join my friends who were now running deeper into the forest. Head towards higher ground! Jake yelled as he led us through a thicket of bushes with renewed determination. As we continued running into what felt like uncharted territory, we stumbled upon a steep hill. Now unsure of how long we had been escaping from this twisted creature of nightmares, Jake led us up the hillside with surprising agility, while Sarah and I followed closely behind him. Alan still gripped his gun firmly, occasionally stopping mid-step to point it at the creature which pursued us relentlessly. Once we reached the top, a sense of relief washed over us as we spotted a ranger's station about half a mile away. Safety was within our reach. Recognizing the urgency, Alan told us to run towards the station while he attempted to ward off the creature and buy us some time. Though hesitant, we agreed to his plan, fearing for our lives. As Sarah, Jake, and I sprinted towards the station, we could hear Alan's gunshots behind us accompanied by the creature's inhuman snarls. We dared not look back. We finally reached the station and desperately pounded on the door. A startled forest ranger opened it and allowed us inside as we tried to catch our breaths. We quickly explained our terrifying encounter and urged him to help Alan. Grabbing his own weapon, the ranger took off with Sarah, Jake, 
and me trailing behind him. As we approached the scene of conflict, we saw Alan lying on the ground. Our hearts sank, fearing the worst. The ranger cautiously inspected Alan while keeping an eye out for the creature. A wave of relief washed over us when he confirmed that he was unconscious but alive. The beast had vanished into thin air, but at least all of us had survived. With Alan safely carried back to the station, medical help was called and he soon regained consciousness. An investigation was launched into our horrifying encounter, though nothing could conclusively identify or locate the creature. Weeks later, as we continue to recover from our ordeal both physically and emotionally, we hold on to one another, grateful for each other's strength in our most vulnerable moments. And amidst whispers of a monstrous creature stalking deep within the forest, we find solace in knowing that during our darkest hour, together we persevered through unimaginable terror and lived to tell our tale. I was standing at the edge of Arthur's Woods, a couple of miles away from the small town of Benningburg, wondering whether to take the shortcut to the other side. It was my first visit to this part of the country, and I detested getting lost, but my buddy Jacqueline had reassured me several times that taking this path through the forest would save me at least an hour. The woods stretched vast and unmoving before me, their spindly trees like twisted fingers reaching for the sky. I sighed, adjusted my backpack, and stepped into the tree line. As I proceeded deeper into Arthur's woods, a suffocating silence enveloped me, a heavy blanket smothering every rustle of leaves underfoot. I kept my gaze on the forest floor, watching for any snakes. I had heard about those rattlesnakes lurking in these parts. The tall trees seemed even more menacing now that they surrounded me, half dead and leafless from the recent fires that had swept through the area. As dusk approached, their shadowy forms cast long ghostly figures on the ground that raised goosebumps on my arms. What was Jacqueline thinking? I muttered under my breath while trudging onward. This place gives me the creeps. Laughter from past memories drifted through my head breaking up tense thoughts, Jacqueline always describing odd people in town as resembling sunburned turtles when she'd visit in college. Suddenly I stumbled on something soft and squishy. Revulsion gut-punched me as I looked down at a deer carcass struggles to maintain its structure. Yet no predator bites were evident. In fact, it seemed more mangled. I moved backward anxiously and glanced around nervously. That's when I noticed it, an eerie figure looming in between two trees off to my left. A thin creature with ungodly long limbs, and what seemed to be a deer skull face topped with jagged antlers stood motionless, staring at me. A shiver ran down my spine, and my breath caught in my throat. The creature's elongated arms ended in clawed hands, and its gaze felt penetrating yet void. It was as if I were looking into an abyss. I wanted to call out for help, but I knew it would be futile. Nobody else could hear me out there. My heart pounded as the grotesque being slowly stalked toward me. Its movements unnaturally smooth and otherworldly. With each step it took, I knew I had to make a decision before it reached me. Fight or flee? Quickly calculating my options... I pulled out the revolver from the waistband of my jeans. While seeing a firearm may not necessarily deter an animalistic monster like this one, I'd always believed in the old adage, better prepared than dead. I aimed the muzzle at the creature's skull-like head and fired two rapid shots. Its body jerked with each shot's impact, but it continued coming at me with only mild hesitation, clearly wounded but far from defeated. In that darkest moment of desperation, I recalled one last off-color joke Jacqueline told before we said our goodbyes. The difference between monsters under your bed and dirty socks? Both make you feel uneasy until you deal with them head-on. 
I didn't know whether or not this creature was capable of understanding humor. However, death himself seemed a more viable option than giving up without trying everything within my capacity. Taking deep breaths against every instinct screaming at me to run, I decided to stand my ground, despite my fear pulsating with each beat of adrenaline coursing through my veins. I stood my ground, watching as the creature continued to approach, unfazed by the bullets lodged in its skull-like head. The eerie silence of the night was shattered by a low guttural growl emanating from the creature's throat, sending chills down my spine. My hands trembled as I fired another shot, but my aim was off and the bullet flew past the creature, lodging itself into a nearby tree. The creature let out an almost mocking snort and quickened its pace. The options I previously considered felt like distant memories terror had hijacked every rational thought. Glancing around frantically for anything that might serve as a weapon or tool for escape, my eyes fell upon a fallen tree branch. It wasn't much but felt slightly reassuring in my grip as I prepared to use it as a last-ditch effort. The creature, now mere feet away, lunged at me with its sharp antlers aimed directly at my chest. With all my might I swung the tree branch at one of its elongated limbs and managed to land a blow. To my surprise, the wood connected with a crunching force that knocked the monster off balance momentarily. I took this unexpected opportunity to flee. Adrenaline pumped through me as I stumbled through the overgrown foliage, hoping against hope that the separation between us would be enough to deter it. The creature, however, was relentless in its pursuit. I could hear its labored breathing growing closer behind me as I pushed myself harder through thicket and darkness. My heart pounded in my ears. Each gasp for air left me feeling more exhausted than before. Finally breaking free from the dense underbrush and stumbling into an open field where moonlight illuminated shapes ahead. A flicker of hope sparked within me at recognizing parked cars. I had reached civilization. As quickly as possible, considering my fatigue and fear-driven state, I pulled out my phone and dialed 911. The operator picked up, and I explained the situation between panting breaths. A wild animal was chasing me and I needed help immediately. Police sirens soon filled the air, a signal of salvation. As I waited, heart pounding against my ribs, the beast emerged from the tree lean with contempt in its empty eye sockets. Just then, blue and red lights flashed into view, causing the creature to hesitate for a fraction of a second. In that moment of uncertainty, I made a split-second decision. Mustering all the strength left within me, I charged at the creature, wielding the remnants of my tree branch like a spear. Caught off guard by this sudden reversal in rolls, it lacked time to adequately react. The splintered wood in my hands connected with the creature's head and pierced through an open wound left by one of my earlier shots. The force sent both myself and the monster tumbling to the ground. Suddenly, police officers poured into the field, guns drawn and aiming at both me and the creature. Responding officers managed to restrain it quickly given its weakened condition as they assessed us both cautiously. I let out a shaky breath as another officer approached me to ensure my safety. Once he verified that I was unarmed and unharmed, apart from scrapes and bruises, he released his grip on me with a nod of reassurance. The officers attempted to identify the defeated monster— but found themselves at a loss given its unusual appearance. This nightmarish nightmare was finally over, but unfortunately, there were no answers or explanations on why it targeted me in particular or where it came from. I won't ever be able to forget the viscerally disturbing events that occurred that night. The reminders came in many forms, remembering those who laid victim to this creature's aggression— recounting this horrific tale for others or documenting statements for very puzzled police investigators. But in this ever-turning world, filled with both hope and despair, the bitter reminder that the unexpected can strike any moment was also our constant companion. 
No matter what preconceptions we have about life and safety, one gruesome encounter with an unknown terror can change everything. The stark reality that we must face is interwoven with the very fabric of our existence. Fear looms, and there are hidden threats around every corner. It's strange how life can throw you a curveball when you least expect it. A simple trip to the remote area of Idaho had turned into something unimaginable, something I hadn't signed up for. My name is Orson Bixby, and I'm just an average guy with an average job. Vacationing out here was meant to be a peaceful retreat from the chaos of city life. The crisp air and the untouched wilderness between Coeur d'Alene and Boise captivated me. In this stretch of land, devoid of any hustle and bustle, I found solace. Until that fateful evening, when everything changed. As the fire crackled beside me, I overheard fellow campers, Luna and Praxton, chatting about a strange creature rumored to roam these parts. Their voices lowered as they exchanged their knowledge apparently unwilling to divulge too much information about the beast. All I could gather were whispers describing elongated limbs, a stag skull for a head with sharp antlers protruding from it, truly the stuff of nightmares. Determined not to let it ruin my camping experience, I took their talk with a grain of salt. After all, such tales are common in remote places like this. Hey, Orson! Praxton called out after noticing my eavesdropping. What do you call a deer with no eyes? What? I asked hesitantly. No idea, he chuckled. Laughing along with his joke helped dissipate some of the unease created by their conversation. Eventually, we all called it a night and headed back to our tents. The following morning began like any other. Breakfast in front of sunrise-tinted mountains followed by a hike through serene woods. Our group consisted of myself, Luna, Praxton, Luna's cousin Vespera, and Jotham Damaraki, a foreign guy who seemed to be fluent in almost every language. As we trekked, we exchanged mundane anecdotes. The biastral character had almost become a myth of the previous night. Later that day, during a lunch break, Praxton wandered off in search of firewood but took much longer than expected to return. Eventually, his strained cries for help echoed through the trees, urging us to leave our sandwiches and sprint toward his desperate voice. We discovered a gruesome sight. Praxton was barely recognizable. His body was covered in wounds, the severity and nature of which were indescribable. Pools of blood formed around him, staining the once immaculate forest floor. Luna's scream pierced the air as her trembling fingers dialed for help on her cell phone. Service in this remote area was spotty at best. No signal! She cried out in despair as tears streamed down her face. We shouldn't have come here! Vespera sobbed, clutching Luna tightly. Surveying the scene with disbelief, I recalled our conversation just the night before. We had unwittingly stumbled into the territory of an apex predator, one that remained life-changingly real despite our skepticism. Jotham took charge. We need to find shelter before nightfall. It's not safe here. With heavy hearts and heavier footsteps, we wandered further into the wilderness as the sky dimmed overhead. Desperation hung in the air like humidity on a hot summer day. As we progressed along an overgrown trail, it became apparent that something was stalking us, a shifting presence lurking just beyond our vision. Terror gripped at our throats. Were we falling into its trap? Or could we evade this nightmare? Suddenly, an agonized shriek echoed through the darkening trees around us. Vespera was gone. Luna's eyes filled with horror as Jotham yelled out for her cousin who had disappeared right beside her. Run! he commanded, a heart-wrenching mix of fear and determination streaming from his words. We sprinted through the trees, 
our breath ragged from fear and exertion. Jotham led the way, followed by Luna and myself. I could feel my legs growing weaker with each step, but I couldn't afford to lose any ground on my companions. As we crossed a small clearing, the creature appeared before us, cutting off our escape route. The terrifying sight of its tall, lanky frame with elongated limbs left no doubt that it was far more powerful than any animal we had ever seen before. Its head looked like a deer or stag skull equipped with sharp antlers that seemed capable of piercing through flesh and bone with ease. Jotham stopped in his tracks, his eyes locked onto the formidable predator that blocked our path. Unable to call for help due to the lack of signal in this remote area, we found ourselves utterly trapped. We need to backtrack, Jotham said firmly, his face pale but resolute. We have to find Vespera and get out of here. We turned and started running back the way we had come. Desperate to find Vespera, we shouted her name through the forest, hoping our voices would carry far enough for her to hear us. A sudden rustling in a bush nearby made us stop abruptly. From the underbrush emerged Vespera, her clothes torn and face scratched as if she had been attacked by a wild animal. Vespera! Luna cried out before she and Jotham rushed to hold her steady. We have to leave this place now. Vespera gasped as she steadied herself with their support. With no other options left, we knew that our only hope for survival was sticking together and finding our way out of this wilderness as quickly as possible. The long hours that followed were a blur of fear and adrenaline-fueled determination. We managed to avoid encounters with the horrific creature while searching for the main trail that would lead us to safety. During a brief pause for water, I spotted a local on a faraway ridge our only hope now was to get the attention of this person who might help us get out. Over here! I yelled at the top of my lungs, waving my arms frantically to attract their attention. Miraculously, the figure noticed us and began making their way in our direction. As the stranger came closer, we could see that they were an older woman likely knowledgeable about the land and possibly even the creature that had been stalking us relentlessly. She stopped short upon seeing our terrified faces, clearly sensing something was wrong. "'What's gotten into you all?' she asked, concern evident in her voice. "'We need to leave this area immediately,' Jotham declared. "'There's something out there, a creature unlike anything we've ever seen.' The woman looked around warily before nodding solemnly. I'll show you the way out. But we need to be quick. We followed her as fast as our exhausted bodies would allow, leaving behind the deeply unsettling landscape that had been both breathtakingly beautiful and utterly terrifying in equal measure. Eventually, we emerged from the treacherous territory and made it back to civilization but not without leaving behind a part of ourselves in that cursed place. We were alive but forever changed by what we had experienced. We never spoke of it again amongst ourselves, too afraid to relive the nightmare by acknowledging its existence. But even years later, whenever I hear an eerie cry echoing through quiet forests or darkened alleyways, I can't help but remember those gruesome events that transpired deep within that malevolent wilderness where Vespera almost lost her life and where we faced unimaginable horrors lurking within its shadows. It all started when my friends and I decided to escape our mundane lives for the weekend. We chose to go camping in the Appalachian Mountains, a remote but beautiful region with breathtaking views and an eerie sense of solitude. My name's Weston Hadley, by the way. Anyway, we were a group of five, myself, Lysander Kirkpatrick, Helene Dufresne, Leandro Lovelace, and Philomena Mallory. We reached our destination and set up our tents. Gathering around the campfire that night, we shared stories and laughed. The jokes never stopped coming 
like the one Lysander told about cows and space shuttles. It was so ridiculous it left us all gasping for air. As darkness enveloped our campsite and the laughter subsided, we called it a night and crawled into our tents. The following day we embarked on a hike through the woods, marveling at Mother Nature's grand design. Everything seemed perfect until we stumbled upon the carcasses of three deer lying in a small clearing. Their throats were torn open, and their bodies appeared scarily maimed. Something brutally attacked them. Unnerved but unwilling to admit it, we shook off the gruesome sight and continued on our hike. That night around the campfire, the atmosphere was somber compared to the previous evening. Conversation turned towards the deer incident. What could have done such a thing? A bear? Philomena suggested jokingly that it was probably just some hillbilly staple diet in these parts. In an attempt to lighten the mood, Leandro pulled out his guitar and began playing some music. That was when we first heard it, a guttural growl echoing through the woods like throwing pebbles on a still pond, eerie ripples reaching out to us. The next day curiosity got the better of us all. We felt compelled to investigate the source of the noise. Armed with knives and a handgun we brought for protection, we ventured deeper into the woods. Footprints were found, but they weren't like any animal tracks we'd seen before, large, elongated, and with what appeared to be sharp talons. That was our first encounter with our uninvited guest. As days went by, the creature shadowed us, never directly affronting us, but making his presence known through guttural growls, strange footprints left outside our tents one morning, and glimpses of elongated limbs disappearing behind trees. The pinnacle of this subtle yet terrifying dance came when Helene ventured away from our campsite to fetch water from a nearby stream. She screamed. We found her trembling by the water's edge, her flashlight aimlessly illuminating the surrounding trees. When she finally managed to stutter out what had happened, we learned that she had come face to face with the creature, its tall, lanky frame and elongated limbs towering above her, its head like a deer or stag skull topped with sharp antlers, its eyes, a terrifying white void devoid of kindness or understanding. No one slept that night. We huddled together in our largest tent like frightened children dreading the monster beneath their beds. Lysander cracked another joke, humor being one of humanity's most ancient defense mechanisms, figuring we might as well die laughing if it ever came down to it. Feeling isolated and helpless in this remote corner of America, calling for help was futile at best. We also knew that no sane person would ever believe us even if they managed to reach us out here. Thus began a game of survival as we attempted to return to civilization knowing that at every step this creature was stalking us. But why? What did it want from us? Our grueling trek continued. The once lush forest now seemed like a nightmare that refused to let us go, each passing day filled with panic and anxiety. We no longer felt in control of our destinies. Every rustle in the leaves, every snap of a twig had us expecting a terrifying, gory end. And so, we pressed on, hoping against hope to find safety. We couldn't call for help because our cell phones had no signal in this remote area. None of us were experienced outdoorsmen, but we knew that sticking together was crucial. That's when Peter suggested leaving markers along our trails, hoping that somehow someone could follow them and help us out. We made makeshift weapons from branches and stones, knowing that they would be of little use against the creature. But at least it gave us a sense of control over the situation. Every hour, we took turns keeping watch while the others rested. There was no point in getting caught off guard. As we continued to move forward through the dense foliage, we noticed a change in the atmosphere around us. The air was heavy and oppressive, as if the trees themselves were trying to harm us. The constant feeling of being watched kept our nerves on edge. One day, as we trudged onward, I heard a sudden scream from Sarah. 
She had been just a few steps behind me when she tripped on something. As I turned around to help her up, I saw what had caused her to trip, a human leg, severed and mangled beyond recognition. It was evident now that we weren't the only ones hunted by this creature. We quickly moved away from the horrifying sight without a word, knowing that stopping could mean death. On the third day since encountering the creature, we stumbled upon an abandoned cabin tucked amidst the trees. Desperate for shelter and safety, we carefully entered the building in hopes of finding some answers or any sign of other people who could help us. Inside, we found signs of a struggle, overturned furniture, and dried blood splattered across the walls and floorboards. We instinctively knew that they hadn't survived their encounter with the creature. Huddled inside the cabin with tears silently streaming down their faces, Peter whispered to me about his plan. We must find a way out of these woods tonight. If we continue, there's no telling how far this thing will follow us. Although we all feared leaving the relative safety of the cabin, we unanimously agreed that staying would be just as dangerous. In the dead of night, we set out once more, our makeshift weapons clutched tightly in trembling hands. We navigated through the dark forest as stealthily as possible hiding at every rustling sound or snapping twig. The creature could be anywhere, lying in wait for us to drop our guard. It wasn't long before the creature struck again. We didn't see it coming until it tore into Lysander with its sharp antlers, lifting him off the ground and effortlessly flinging his lifeless body into the undergrowth. At that moment, something changed within us. A fire ignited in our veins as we realized that it was now or never. We couldn't stay helpless forever. Either we fought back or perished like Lysander. Peter shouted for us to run as fast as we could and not look back. As we sprinted through the darkness with every ounce of strength left in our bodies, he stayed behind to face the creature himself, perhaps in a final attempt at self-sacrifice for our escape. We didn't stop running until the first rays of sunlight broke through the tree's canopy above us. We had unknowingly reached a road while fleeing from the creature. Suddenly, a car skidded to a halt in front of us, its headlights blinding us momentarily. We didn't care who was driving. Anything was better than staying lost in those woods with that monstrous creature hunting us down one by one. Exhausted and covered in dirt and sweat, we collapsed into the vehicle as it sped away from our nightmare. The driver listened to our frantic stories with wide-eyed disbelief but ultimately decided not to question our sincerity. In time, we left those harrowing events behind us, never forgetting the friends we lost and the horrifying creature that had hunted us relentlessly. We never learned what it was or why it attacked us, but one thing was certain— None of us would ever venture near those woods again. I stepped off the bus in Davis, West Virginia, feeling an itch to explore the dense woods and rolling Appalachian mountains surrounding me. The quaint town seemed out of a fairy tale with log cabins, wooden bridges, and mom and pop businesses. My name is Bronson Zephyr, and I never imagined this cozy trip would turn into a living nightmare. While setting up camp near a pristine lake, I struck up a conversation with two locals, Clementine Darby and her brother Archibald. They shared local legends of peculiar sightings around the forest as friendly banter but there was honesty mixed with their laughter that made me wonder if something sinister lurked beneath the surface. One evening while hiking through the dimming light, we stumbled upon scorched earth surrounded by splintered trees. It looked like a bomb went off but without any visible damage to the surrounding vegetation. You know what's strange? This wasn't here last week, said Clementine nervously. Archibald shared her concern but attempted to lighten the mood. Well, you know what they say about the creatures of these parts. They appreciate contemporary design. We laughed nervously and kept moving, 
but I couldn't shake my unease. Days later, as dusk approached, we embarked on another hike along a different path. We stumbled upon an eerie scene, torn clothing and rusty weapons scattered upon blood-speckled ground. The sight sent shivers down my spine. That looks like Ansel's jacket, whispered Clementine fearfully. Archibald examined the scene further revealing human remains partially hidden in the underbrush. Let's call the police, I said, pulling out my phone only to find no signal whatsoever. Ironic that when we really needed help it was utterly unreachable. Suddenly we heard snapping branches from behind us and turned to see our worst fear realized. A grotesque creature emerged from the shadows. Tall and lanky, its elongated limbs supported a deer skull head with sharp, menacing antlers that scraped the sky. The creature inched closer, its bone-chilling gaze never leaving us. I fumbled to grab my hunting knife from my belt as Archibald raised his shotgun. We tried our best to formulate a plan, but fear consumed us. Our arms trembled as we took defensive stances, trying to appear more threatening than we felt. The creature hesitated for a second then lunged towards us, its antlers pointed like deadly spears. As Archibald let off a spray of gunfire and I plunged my knife into the creature's side, rage flickered in its hollow eyes. It swiped at Archibald with a skeletal paw, leaving deep gashes across his chest and knocking him to the ground. Clementine screamed and tried to push the creature away, but it was too strong. I grabbed Archibald's shotgun and aimed for its skull, my heart pounding in my ears. The creature turned its focus to me, giving me just enough time to shoot. The deafening sound echoed through the woods as the creature stumbled back, wounded but not defeated. Run! I yelled at Clementine, who nodded, tears streaming down her face. We sprinted as fast as our legs could carry us leaving Archibald's motionless body behind. We ran until our lungs burned and our legs ached. The forest seemed to close in around us, the creature's chilling presence always near. As we made our way through dense undergrowth, we stumbled upon a desolated cabin. Reaching for the doorknob with shaky hands, I found it unlocked, and we hurried inside. No signal, Clementine muttered, checking her phone for any chance of contacting help. We need to find somewhere safe, I said determinedly. Knowing that death lurked outside, we decided to stay put in our newfound sanctuary. We scavenged for weapons within the dilapidated cabin, anything that could help us fend off the terrifying creature. Finally, we settled on some rusty tools from a back room. As night fell and darkness enveloped the woods, the twisted branches on trees appeared even more menacing. The creature was still out there, we could sense it, but it hadn't found us yet. Hours crawled by like years as we fought against drowsiness while keeping watch for any sign of the dreadful being. Clementine paced nervously while I sat by the window, eyes peeled for any movement. You think this will work? she asked hesitantly, clutching a heavy wrench. It'll have to, I replied grimly. Our lives depend on it. The hours continued their sluggish march. At that point, every rustle of leaves, every creak of the cabin stirred unease in our tense bodies. Just as the first rays of daylight made their way across the sky, we heard it, the distinct sound of something crashing through the underbrush towards us. The creature appeared, even more dreadful than when we first encountered it. As it drew closer, blood dripped from its antlers and wounds. It snarled, baring its jagged teeth and revealing fresh gore. Clementine and I looked at each other, united in our resolve to face this horrifying threat. With a ragged yell, I swung my makeshift weapon, a crowbar, at the creature's skull. It howled in pain as Clementine followed up with a blow from her wrench. The creature fought back viciously, its skeletal paws slashing through the air as it tried to disembowel us. 
we gritted our teeth and endured its relentless onslaught. Our desperate struggle continued until the woods resounded with a blaring siren. The creature paused mid-swipe, head snapping in the direction of the noise. What is that? Clementine asked breathlessly. Help, I gasped. In our fear-filled haste hours before, I had accidentally initiated an emergency SOS call on my phone. It must have finally reached someone. The growing sound of police sirens and search dogs soon filled our ears. The creature roared in frustration before retreating into the woods with unnatural speed. Relief washed over us as officers burst into the cabin to find Clementine and me bruised but alive. We shared our harrowing tale and led them to Archibald's body. His sacrifice should not be forgotten. We may have survived that gruesome night, but we knew deep down that the nightmare didn't end there. The creature, its name still unknown, remained hidden somewhere within those dark woods. And if it were ever to return, we, the survivors, would have to summon our strength and face the horror once more. I remember that moment when I heard the first chilling scream. It felt as real as sunlight streaming through the trees. My name is Sterling Dupree, and that moment is etched in my mind forever. I was visiting Rockcliffe Mansion, a popular tourist attraction in Hannibal, Missouri, with my friends Amity and Zephyr. Little did we know what awaited us on that life-altering trip. Our day began like any other. We finished taking some photos of the mansion's impressive exterior before exploring its historic halls and rooms. I had always been fascinated by crime stories and Amity shared my keen interest in true crime experiences, so this place seemed perfect for our vacation. As we navigated the darkest corners of the mansion, it was apparent that time had taken its toll on this once magnificent estate. Peeling wallpaper clung to the walls like an old wound refusing to heal. Dusty chandeliers hung above like ghosts of opulence past. We were inspecting the ornate moldings surrounding a ghastly painting when we suddenly heard a distant cry. It sounded horrific, like someone was being mutilated before our very eyes. Puzzled by this inexplicable noise, we decided to investigate further. What do you think it could be? I asked my friends as we tentatively made our way down a creaky set of stairs into the basement. Maybe it's just an animal, Amity suggested, trying to rationalize the sound. Hearing her say that reminded me to ask her about that old joke she used to tell to lighten up tense situations. Hey Amity, I whispered nervously. Remember that silly joke about the chicken who went to see a horror movie? What was it? He thought it was excruciating, she replied, grinning despite her fear. Our laughter filled the air but was interrupted abruptly by another horrifying shriek from deep within the basement. As we carefully walked down the dimly lit hallway, we came across an open door leading into a small room, its charred walls revealing that a fire had occurred long ago. Cautiously, we entered the room and saw something that stopped us in our tracks. A grotesque creature, tall and lanky with elongated limbs, stood at the far end. Its head resembled a deer or stag skull with sharp antlers. I couldn't fathom how such a monstrous being could exist. Without warning, the creature lunged towards us. We scattered instinctively in all directions. Zephyr managed to escape down another corridor while Amity and I took refuge behind an old bookshelf. Heart pounding in my chest, I dared to peek through a crack in our hiding place to monitor the creature's whereabouts. We were momentarily safe, but thoughts about our encounter raced through my mind like a whirlwind. What was that demonic being? How did it come into existence? Amity and I frantically discussed our options. We should have called for help but realized that would expose our current location to the creature. Instead, 
We devised a plan to use Amity's pocket knife and whatever makeshift weapons we could find to defend ourselves if necessary. Through hushed voices, we called out for Zephyr in hopes he was still alive. Miraculously, he responded. Describing his hiding spot meant he couldn't be too far from us. As we slowly crept out from behind the bookshelf to find Zephyr, Amity whispered in horror. Sterling, look! The monster was dragging an unconscious man by his leg down the hallway. I think... I think it's planning on eating him, she continued with wide eyes full of terror. The harrowing reality hit me like a ton of bricks. We had become prey in a dangerous game of survival against this bloodthirsty creature. Fearful for our lives, we hesitated to move but knew that we had no choice. We needed to find Zephyr and regroup, to come up with a plan to fend off the merciless beast. Taking a deep breath and focused on every step, we continued to navigate the labyrinthine corridors of the basement. Time seemed to stand still as we inched our way closer towards finding our friend. As we rounded the corner, we finally spotted Zephyr curled up in a dark alcove, trying his best to stay hidden. He looked visibly shaken, but otherwise unharmed. Zephyr, thank God you're okay, I whispered, pulling him out of the alcove and embracing him. We need to get out of here. But what about the others? he asked softly. If they're still alive, we'll call for help once we're safe. Amity replied, determination in her voice. Cautiously, we retraced our steps through the maze of corridors, always looking over our shoulders for any sign of that terrifying creature. Our makeshift weapons seemed pitifully inadequate against such a monstrous foe, and without much forethought on how to use it effectively. We finally managed to find our way back to the stairwell leading to the main floor only to hear heavy footsteps echoing above us. With bated breaths, we waited for what felt like an eternity until relative silence returned before ascending the stairs. The hallway leading to the exit appeared empty and eerily quiet. Stay low and be quiet, I instructed as we crept toward the door. As we approached it, I couldn't shake the feeling that this was too easy. And as if on cue, a crashing sound echoed behind us. The creature had found us again. We sprinted toward the door in a state of panic as it let out an unearthly howl before giving chase. Upon reaching the door and hurling ourselves into the night air, Amity quickly grabbed her phone from her pocket and dialed 911 as we continued running toward safety. We explained our location and situation to the responder praying that help would arrive soon while avoiding streetlights and any areas where we could be noticed by the relentless monster pursuing us. Unable to outrun it any longer as exhaustion took its toll on our battered bodies, we managed to take shelter in an abandoned building. Holding our breaths, we listened for any sign of that creature stalking the night. Just when the adrenaline was starting to wear off, and the survivors' guilt set in for leaving those behind, sirens filled the night air. Sudden relief washed over us as we realized help had finally arrived. As the authorities searched the building from which we'd barely escaped hours before, they found no trace of the creatures or our companions who'd been taken. As time went on, stories about that night started to lose their credibility. Some people chalked it up to a case of mass hysteria or overactive imaginations. Taking one last look at the now cordon off building, I couldn't help but feel a shiver run down my spine. The creature that terrorized us left behind a lingering sense of dread. While our lives would eventually return to normality, for Amity, Zephyr, and me, it remains etched into our memories a chilling reminder that there are things lurking in the shadows that defy logical explanation. Standing before the news reporters and recounting our harrowing ordeal, I knew that nothing could erase the anguish for those unaccounted companions lost in darkness forever. So with deep sorrow and an uneasy feeling of uncertainty gnawing at my conscience, we continued with life one day at a time.
and although we may never fully understand what happened to our friends or why such a horrifying creature crossed our path that fateful evening, one thing remains true. Those moments will haunt us for the rest of our days. I was standing at the edge of an unsettling forest, miles away from civilization. My name's Carter Mullins, by the way. The forest was dense and intimidating, situated in a remote area in the U.S. Data, a place known as the Ocala National Forest, in Florida. It was rumored to be home to some strange creature, but I never believed in myths and legends. In my eyes, there were stories created by people trying to explain natural phenomena they didn't understand. And there I was, investigating one of those stories on behalf of the local authorities. As I ventured deeper into the forest, I came across two men, Keith Hawley and Roland Wichinski, who were arming themselves with guns and journalists' equipment. They shared my skeptical attitude and chuckled when we discussed the peculiar inhabitants rumored to inhabit these woods. During moments of comic relief, we crunched on some stale deli sandwiches Keith had brought with him, probably one of his terrible attempts at humor. Eventually, we agreed to work together and share our findings. The serene atmosphere sent shivers down my spine despite my rational stance on the matter. As we continued exploring, we stumbled upon something eerie that would fuel anyone's imagination, an animal carcass brutally dissected with incredible precision. It was reminiscent of skilled butchery rather than any natural wildlife behavior. We photographed it, exchanging uneasy glances. Deeper into the woods, we spotted humanoid footprints larger than any we had ever seen. Chills crept up our spines as we imagined what could leave such tracks. More cautious now yet committed to our pursuit of truth, we tread silently and deliberately. Our skepticism began to dwindle as we entered a clearing with several human-like skeletal remains arranged in a perfect circle, an unnerving sight that terrified even hard-hearted investigators like us. It appeared like a peculiar ritual site untouched by modern civilization. The sun disappeared beyond the horizon, casting darkness across the trees and leaving us with only our flashlights as a guide. Suddenly, we heard rustling branches in the distance, signaling an approaching presence. Our hearts pounded wildly in our chests as adrenaline coursed through our veins. Through the dim light of the moon and our flashlights, we caught sight of an unsettling figure. Its tall, lanky frame with elongated limbs sent cold shivers down our backs. Our eyes fixated on its head which resembled a deer or stag skull equipped with sharp antlers, the very creature rumored to stalk these woods. We stumbled backward in horror but quickly understood that there would be no escape from this abomination. Keith and Roland raised their guns, aiming them at the menacing creature that appeared to have emerged straight from the darkest depths of a nightmare. Why didn't you call for help earlier? I whispered hysterically at my newfound companions. No signal, Roland replied as his hands trembled gripping his weapon. But don't worry, Carter. I think we can handle this. Gradually, the creature began stalking towards us. Heedless of danger and fear coursing through our veins, Keith fired several shots in succession. The bullets pierced the beast's body but seemed to have no effect other than enraging it further. Panicking, I tried to call for help on my phone, but just like Roland said, there was no signal. The creature kept advancing towards us, seemingly unfazed by the bullets lodged in its body. Out of ideas! Keith yelled. In desperation, I scanned our surroundings for a possible escape route or something that might help against this monstrous being. Distantly, I spotted a row of boulders beyond the trees. Guys! Over there! We can at least barricade ourselves temporarily! I shouted while pointing to the boulders. 
we all sprinted towards them as the creature pursued. Reaching the makeshift protection, we scrambled to pile up rocks and whatever else we could find to act as a barrier between us and our pursuer. Out of breath, we managed to create a small wall, giving us reprieve from immediate danger but only for a short while. We knew it wouldn't hold for long, and we needed to come up with another plan, fast. Desperate for options, Roland confessed that he had flares in his backpack. They might not do much to this thing, he admitted cautiously. But at least we can try. As if it sensed our plotting, the creature roared ferociously and charged toward our makeshift fortress. Keith hurriedly grabbed one of the flares and lit it with trembling hands. As it crashed into the barrier, we watched in horror as rocks scattered like pebbles before its immense strength. In that moment of chaos, Keith hurled the lit flare directly at the creature. To our surprise and relief, the creature howled in pain as it reared back away from us. It appeared angry yet fearful of the burning flare's intense heat. No time to waste! Keith commanded as he threw flares to both Roland and me before grabbing another for himself. Light them up and run! We hastily lit our flares, holding them out like protective talismans, and dashed through the forest, keeping the boulders behind us. Our lungs burned, and our legs ached in protest at the relentless pace, but we didn't dare stop. The creature's menacing growls echoed in the darkness, spurring us on. Finally, after hours of running with nothing but adrenaline as fuel, we noticed the first hints of dawn on the horizon. We reached an open clearing bathing us in soft sunlight. It seemed that the beast's pursuit had ceased, for now. We collapsed on the ground, gasping for air and unable to speak. Our desperate gamble had worked but what then? Would it return again tonight, or when we least expected it to haunt our lives? We need to find help. Roland croaked after a long silence. No matter what it takes. We all knew he was right. The creature might still be out there, waiting for nightfall to strike again. We couldn't let that happen, not to us nor anyone else. As we gathered around and shared stories about those who had fallen victim to this terrible predator in one way or another, friends, family members, strangers, our resolve only grew stronger. We couldn't afford to become mere statistics. We can mourn later, but for now, we need to fight back or die trying, Keith declared with determination. With heavy hearts but newfound purpose, we set out towards civilization once more. We didn't have all the answers yet, or even know if we stood a chance against such an adversary. But we knew that no matter what awaited us in this gruesome battle against darkness itself, we'd face it together. Hopes for victory aflame like a never-fading flare.